even out of Clearwater, Florida, welcome to my world. Oh, hi, Bruce. Hello there. So we especially like your show and respect your opinion on real estate matters, um, particularly. This has to do with title insurance on a piece of property we're considering purchasing. What state? Uh, in Florida, where they, uh, the seller is required to provide it. I was about to point that out. Florida is one of the few states where the seller pays for title insurance. Most states, the buyer pays for it. Yes, I realize. Uh, now, the title insurance commitment, you, you know what I'm referring to, the commitment by the title insurance company, mm -hmm. like a binder would yeah. be. So they uh, say, yeah, the, the property looks okay and we'll get a, we'll get a policy. Right. Uh, on this commitment uh, that the title insurance company gives to the prospective purchaser, mm -hmm. they list uh, requirements to be complied with, is how it reads. Yeah. And the first category is, uh, under a heading, a place for where mortgages that the seller has on the property uh, should be listed. Now, the title insurance company... They want to know if the property is currently encumbered, is what they're saying. Exactly, yes. Right. Well, that's now, pretty, pretty forthright. That's right. So far, so good. Now, how, here's the problem. The title insurance company wants to leave that particular area blank. Blank. There are, uh, there's a one uh, first mortgage, a large one. Uh -huh. There's also a second mortgage. Uh -huh. Now, would you accept uh, a title insurance policy that fails to list the what mortgages that the what seller has on the property? I don't think it may. First of all, the, 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 this is before the closing. The before closing, the closing. It's at the closing is what's what's important. That the mortgages have been satisfied by the closing. And secondly, as a practical matter, as long as the title policy is in place, they're on the hook, not you, if there's a oh, problem. Even if they leave it blank? If there's a pro they guarantee that you have a clean title. That's what title insurance is. Uh -huh. Let me ask you a silly question, and I got a feeling I'm going to get the silly answer from you. <laughs> have you discussed this with your attorney? Yes. Yeah. You have an, wait a minute. You have an attorney representing you in this in this transfer of title, do you? Yes, we do. And what does your attorney yeah. say? Originally, the that the mortgage was to be listed. Yeah. Now we received a call just recently from the attorney saying that the title insurance company wants to just leave that blank, Until and that at the at the closing, the mortgages would be paid off. What did I just get through saying? Well, you see, that gives us nothing in a written form. We just go to the closing. At the cl well, wait a minute. At the closing, they've got to show you satisfaction of mortgage. And how do they do that? In writing. Who, who would give us this? Would, the seller would give it to you. Give or alternatively, the funds would go to your attorney who will pay off the mortgage. What happens, the title insurance company said they will take the funds. All right, the same thing. And they thing. will pay off the well, mortgage. Same thing. Uh, so that we should not be concerned that be the no. mortgages uh, are not going to be listed. It's not. It doesn't make a damn what's listed now. Suppose it said none, right? Suppose yeah. it said none. Build in none. Mm -hmm. What is to prevent them from getting a mortgage between now and the time it closes? Well, I thought they searched that. Well, it doesn't matter. They search it on January the 10th. I remember today's date is 9th. What's to prevent them on the 13th from going down and getting a mortgage? Coming to me privately, a Bruce Flint is 100 grand, we'll give you a first mortgage. What's to prevent that? Uh, well, I, Hello? Suppose, I suppose it wouldn't be granted one when they, they're you, all, well, well, well. already mortgaged. It wasn't what I said to you. What I said was, suppose there is no mortgage as of today, so now the line is filled in none. So far, were you with me? Yeah. Now. Today's Monday. Wednesday, they come to me as a private citizen, because you can grant mortgages as a private person. You're aware of that. Yes. And I give him a more first mortgage. And a pro I give him money, he gives me a first mortgage. Mm -hmm. Well, what's changed? The lot, you, you're happy because it says none, but in reality, there is a mortgage, isn't there? What they've left it, not, it doesn't Listen say none, to me. it's just blank. It blank. doesn't matter. Well, suppose it said none. That would make you very happy, wouldn't it? No, it wouldn't, because Why? we already know there. We don't oh, come on. If there were no mortgages, wouldn't you not be happy with none? Oh, if there were not. That's what I'm saying. But yeah, that we, doesn't tell you a damn thing, because he can mortgage it tomorrow morning. We have, it is, oh, listen to me. It is not what is today. It is the day of closing that should concern you. 
And well, the, mor the mortgages won't be paid off until the day of closing. Well, what did I just get through saying? Oh, well, this is the problem. The mortgages are more than the value of the property. That's his problem. If he doesn't have the if he doesn't have the money to put in escrow with the with the uh, title company, he ain't gonna close. And that couldn't become a lien against this property. No, ma'am, because oh dear, it'll Lord. be a cash deal on our part. Fine, but you've got a title company guaranteeing the title, and they're gonna take your cash, and they are gonna pay off the mortgage. Is that a correct scenario? Well, well, that's what we hope. What course. do you mean you hope? Well, we have nothing here stating that. You do have an attorney representing you, do you yeah. not? Well, that's what the attorney's job is. Uh, <laughs> the fact that it's filled out or not filled out is not an issue as I view it. Well, originally it was filled out, then well, they removed it. I don't it. think it matters. It's what happens the day of closing that matters, not what happens today. Ten things could happen between now and then. That's why they do an updated search. You feel comfortable with this? Yes, ma'am. As long as I got a title policy in my name the day we close. Mm -hmm. For the the correct amounts. See, we've we've just never encountered this. We've had title insurance on uh, properties before, sure. yeah. but it was it would always state uh, any mortgage. Any First of all, I don't ever recall even looking at the documents you're talking about. I, I don't look at that stuff. That's what I pay attorneys for. And I mean that very sincerely. Well, we happen to look at it. I don't practice law, and they don't practice. They don't, not one of them does a talk show. Uh, what do you do for a living? We're retired. Okay. Well, what did you do for a living? Oh, we were in business. All right. Did your attorney come and, run and stand behind the counter? No. Oh, you do what you do well. Let him do what he does well. Or she do what she does well. Uh, uh, I have no problem with you looking at this stuff. We've had a couple of different... There's been changes. And first, the attorney wanted it in. Then he thought it wasn't necessary for it to be in. But he's the guy who's feet in the fire if he makes a mistake. The attorney? Absolutely. It's sue his butt. Oh, we don't want to get in anything like that. So that's well, why, why do you think I hire attorneys? Seriously. You know what I mean? Well, I just talked to my guy who's in the hospital right now. He's handling two or three matters for me. Now, this is an extremely close personal friend. All right? Mm -hmm. But he knows. And, and my insurance broker is another. Well, these two guys had to be like some of my closest friends. All right? Mm -hmm. Some years ago, when my insurance broker told me that certain coverage is in place, and he made a mistake. And we had a hell of a loss. Well, that's what we're trying to avoid. I sued him. <laughs> I put a woman, he, he, and he admitted he made a mistake. That's why I use professionals. Mm -hmm. Because if they make a mistake, I'm coming after them. And that's, that's as it should be. That's as it should be. And if you get in there, you have every right to ask questions. But I don't want you taking any responsibility, whatever. They take the responsibility. You're laughing, but I'm deadly no, no, serious. No, I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. I, I, well, so am I. I'm serious as a heart attack. That's I'm, funny. I'm serious as a heart attack. Mm -hmm. I would sue a professional in a heartbeat who was a very close personal friend. I would have nothing to do with our friendship if they made a mistake. Mm -hmm. And my, as it turned out, the settlement came in just under the policy limits, so there was no excess. We didn't have to worry about it. But about a, about a, about a, let there be no doubt. That had it gone over that, I'd have looked to him for recovery. If my lawyers, and I have a bunch that work for me or work with me, do different matters, if they make a mistake, have no doubt I'm coming after them. Because that's what I pay them for. If my accountants make a mistake with my taxes and it's their mistake, you better believe that they know that I expect them to pay. Now, in all other real estate transactions we've ever been involved with, and they were always with title insurance mm -hmm. any kind of mortgage first second any kind oh, we're beating of a dead horse pages, we're know. beating a dead horse i don't know if you know that to be the case did you always look at these papers every oh, yes, time yes, okay we well you're better than I you're guess we're unusual but we then do. you're smarter than i am well, I not you. necessarily yeah. but cautious you know. well then you're more cautious than i <laughs> that's why i you you know when i jump out of an airplane i have a reserve parachute that's my insurance policy <laughs> and when i talk to a professional he is my reserve parachute I'm not going to tell you I, don't, I couldn't handle some of these things. I probably could, but I never do, and I don't think you should either. Look it over, ask questions. Oh, well, we've done a lot but of as that. Long as That's why you, I'm calling it you. It sounds to me like you're at, well, okay. <laughs> be concerned on, on closing day, not today. That's where you want to be certain there are no encumbrances. And you say the title insurance company should give you something. Uh, it's called a title policy. No, but then, no, That's no. it. That's no, it. Policy. That's, That's it. it. Uh -huh. The title policy. That's yeah. it. Well... That's right, it. Then. What's the purpose of a title policy? To say, we guarantee that your title is clean. 
You see, we no. haven't seen that. We well, honey, you don't see that till the day you close. I realize that. That's the problem. And you don't... Oh, for crying out loud, i got to let you go. Why would that be a problem? That's when you get it. Okay, then. How can they issue it a day before? Tell me. No, no, I was only looking at the commitment. Which Without they regard us, to that. They told but, us the policy would okay. be a duplication of the commitment. Well, the poli we're looking at I'm that. not certain that that's true. Well, that's what they said. The, the, policy is a duplic the policy says that we guarantee you, you give us so much money that you have a clean poli you have a clean title. And if you don't, we will pay to clean it or give you so many dollars. Mm -hmm. That's what it's all about. But not as of today, because you have no interest today. It's as of the day you close. Because an IRS lien could come along between now and then. What then? What then? Okay. Somebody oh. could die. I got to close. You come up in two weeks. Suppose one of the two people I have a contract would die. Suppose I die. Say la vie, as the French say. I wish you well, baby. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Oh, well, I'm sure she was un unhappy with my answer, but for crying out, that's what pros are about. Gainesville, Florida, your turn. Mr. Williams. Hey, how you doing? I'm a 21-year-old college student. I've been listening to you since 580 WDBO in Orlando started carrying you, and well... Yeah, that's when you were in diapers about that time. Uh, I was pretty close. Yeah, I guess. Uh, What's on your mind? I purchased a computer part uh, from an individual in another part of the country. A person? Not a, not a company? Yes, an individual. Okay. And um, he shipped it to me, COD. Right. And I gave the uh, the agent for the shipping company my uh, money order. Right. And the person at the other end never received the money order. Why not? Um, the I guess the shipping company lost it. You do have a. a I, I have a, re a, a carbon receipt. Yeah. Okay. What what kind of a money order? A, 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 a post U.S. postal money order. Postal. That's the worst kind. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, no, it's not sorry, but you. I think you've probably found that out. I want you to hang on just for a minute while we take a little time out and we'll get back together and we'll talk about it. I'm Bruce Wiggins. This is Talk Net. I am chatting with a young fellow in Gainesville, Florida. He uh, purchased the computer part, if memory serves me, with, um, from, I'm sorry, not with, but rather from uh, a private party, paid for it with UPS or somebody with a postal money order. Right? Yes, sir. And then the shipper somehow or other misplaced the postal money order. Yes, sir. Okay, let's go from there. I said, the touch said, wow, it's the worst kind to buy. I stand by that. Well. Because dealing with a post office is a pain where you don't get a headache. If you, It takes you a long, long time to do a, um, a tracer, which you could do with a private company or a private institution, uh, geometrically more quickly and maybe even more important with less fuss. Well, I'm, right. I'm finding that out. Yeah. How much is the money order for? Uh, four hundred eighteen dollars and fifty-seven cents. Okay, about, <laughs> about. <laughs> approximately. <laughs> and what is what does the shipping company say? Well, the uh, the gentleman at the other end filed a claim with the shipping company, and okay. they cut him a check. Okay. He's taken care of. Okay. Now the shipping company has um, turned me over to a collection agency to give them four hundred eighteen dollars. On what basis? Uh, I don't know. I I have. I, I don't understand. I called the uh, the shipping company this evening, and they said, well, our accounting department will get back to you at some point. At some point? Uh, yes. I'd fire a letter off to them instantly. You have, a re you have a receipt from the agent of the shipping company. Is that correct? No. What do you mean, no? You gave it to them, didn't you? No, I have a uh, the carbon of the uh, money order. That's not have, enough. And I have the product. That's I not enough. Anything else. Well, when did you get the product? When they handed you the product? Yes. Did they not give you a receipt when you handed them the money order? Uh, no, they did not. I've they, never they, never gotten one that way. Did you ask? Uh, no, sir, I did not. That's a little different story, isn't it? Yes, sir. You, know, you have nothing to prove. Well, let me, let me turn the thing around. The thing was sent COD, is that correct? Yes, sir. Well, why would they, I mean, your argument, why would they give this thing to me, COD, if I didn't give them something? Yes. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir, I do. I'd fire a letter off to them immediately. I would say that when the, on such a date, COD merchandise that I um, had ordered was delivered to my home office, whatever it happens to be. At that time, I gave your agent a, a U.S. money order, blah, 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 blah whatever the numbers are on there, for the amount of $400 and change. Uh, 
no receipt for this transaction was offered. However, clearly there is evidence of the transaction I, as I described it because the merchandise was given to me and equally clearly the agent would not, your agent would not give me the merchandise without the appropriate payment. Okay? Yes, sir. Then the next paragraph is, uh, I am highly resentful of your collection methods. I am perfectly agreeable to uh, cooperating in, in filling out any lost money order app, uh, 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 papers that are required by the post office so you can recover your funds. But I wish to notify you that I guard my reputation, both credit and otherwise, jealously, and will hold you civilly responsible, civilly responsible, for any damage that uh, this suffers because of your clearly inappropriate action. I get that off certified mail. I hate to say mail, because I'll tell you, I, I'm, not, I'm so disenchanted with the post office department anymore. Uh, I mean, we're lost mail. I mean, everybody, I talked to a fellow with a bank the other day, so they have whole a day when nothing, no mail comes to a bank. Well, that's absurd. I mean, you know, circular, something's going to come in a big bank. I've had day, made days of my business. I had a package I sent 47 days insured to, to be delivered to the, I was perfectly addressed. And I've had a number of pieces of mail that I've sent recently haven't been delivered at all. So, and, the, and when you buy a money order, the post office, try and track it down. They'll tell you it takes months. You go to your local bank and buy a, a cashier's check or something, some other similar instrument, it's much easier to track down and, and, uh, and straighten out. Oh, well, I, I, I deal with them only with junk mail at this point. Yes. I'm serious. It's a sorry commentary. And I don't think it's any individual who works for the post office uh, problem. I'm sure there are tens of thousands of very z uh, zealous, hardworking people. But the system right now stinks. And that business with the money, how, what did they tell you? How long would it take to track down a money order? Um, I went and picked up the paperwork to do it today, and they said it would be uh, several weeks. To, it is not ridiculous. To, uh, I would think so. But. Several weeks. And you paid for this, you see. All 75 cents, in fact. Yeah. Well, that isn't the issue. The issue is you paid for service, and they are very slow in delivering a, when you have a problem. I would never, never pay for this with a postal money order, personally. Oh, thank you very much. But but fire that letter off that I described. Yes, sir. I and be don't you know you then be firm. That these guys, I mean, they it's obvious that one of two things happened. They did what they were not supposed to do by giving you the merchandise without payment, which I can tell you they just don't do. At least they've never done in my experience. Or they lost it. Either way, not your problem. You're willing to cooperate, but you're not willing to be browbeat. Iowa City, Iowa. Hello there. Hello. Hi. How are you doing? I'm doing real well, thanks. Bruce, I have a problem with a um, uh, brand new car that I just bought. I, it's a situation that I've never heard of, and I never wanted to know if you heard of it before. Let us talk. Uh, I live in Iowa City, and I bought a, looked around here for a car and didn't find the one that I wanted. And I went to uh, an agency in Des Moines, Iowa, which is about 120 miles from here, mm -hmm. and bought the car. And, uh, you mean, when you say agency, you mean another another dealership? Another dealership. Sure. And uh, bought the car, brought it home, and they delivered it fine, and the car was okay. And I've had the car, I bought it on October 1st and just took it in for its first service at my local dealer here yeah. to have the oil and filter changed. Sure. And the next day, the sales manager called me, and he told me that he would prefer that I didn't bring the car in there for any further warranty work or service work in the future. Why? Well, that's what I asked him, and he, he said, said, because they don't like to service cars bought outside the local area. Well, that's too damn bad. They have a franchise with Ford, General Motors, Mazda, whoever it happens to be, to do exactly that. And you uh, advise him of that. I called back to the general manager, mm -hmm. and uh, he said that that policy had been in effect for some time, and the reason for the policy, because they... Uh, made money selling cars, and they didn't make money on their service. No, that's unfortunate. And I thought, I've never heard of such a thing. Well, first of all, I, I've heard that story, too. It was interesting. I do commercials. I just did one tonight for, for a Cadillac agency, very frankly. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and I was at a, visited one of the dealers, and it was a big dealership. And I said, well, boy, it's a hell of a big service area. It's a shame you don't make any money. He said, what are you talking about? I don't make any money. So of course I make money in the service area. Interesting. I didn't think they did. Mm. I've been told that. But the fact is that dealer has an obligation, an obligation to service that car. Now, I can understand what they're saying. And you told me they couldn't sell you the car you wanted. Is that correct? Right. Because if you said, look, I saved 100 bucks by going to Des Moines, I'd have very little sympathy for you. Well, but that was was that the case or was well, it? Well, there there was a money difference when I went to the other, but it was eight hundred dollars. It wasn't a matter of a hundred dollars. Did you go there? $100. Did you go for the money or did you go for the because you couldn't find the car? Which well, was both because they didn't have the color I wanted and the price was different also. Hmm. Well, eight hundred bucks a lot of money. I agree with that. Well, I, that's what I thought. Now, my situation is I the closest dealer I have is thirty five miles away, um, in Cedar Rapids, and. Um, this dealer who refuses to do service on my car is about two or three minutes from my house. Well, the fact is he has an obligation in his franchise. Now, he doesn't have an obligation to give you, uh, he has to give you good service, meaning he, he's got to do the car properly. But he doesn't have to take you at a moment's notice. Yeah, I understand that. Uh, as he might for a regular customer. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, I want you to hang on a minute, okay? Mm -hmm. There's got to be somebody or two out there that owns a car dealership, and I know you come up against this kind of stuff all the time. How would you handle it? Uh, I mean, I, I know you wouldn't like it when you lose a customer to somebody else. I, I certainly wouldn't if I were in business on the other side of that. There's got to be, I hope if you're a smart dealer, there are times when you're cut, people are going to come to you from 100 miles away because you're given the best possible deals around or whatever. Or somebody moves into town from uh, someplace. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we're, we're a mobile society. What are you supposed to do when you, when you live in uh, Pennsylvania and uh, you move to Des Moines? Stop going to the, uh, you know, you, well, my car doesn't get serviced. That's nonsense. If you're in the automobile business, I'd love to hear from you. It's 703-413-8381. 703-413-8381. I have a suspicion that there are a lot of dealers who disagree with the, the attitude of these folks. Maybe not. 703-413-8381. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. By golly, I have a lady, or a gentleman, I'm sorry, in Iowa City, Iowa, bought a car out of town in Des Moines, as a matter of fact. And now the guy in Iowa City, the dealer says, don't come here, you didn't buy it here. I have a car dealer, would you believe, from Des Moines. Hello there. Hello, sir. How you doing, guy? I'm doing great tonight. It's good to finally talk to you on well, your show. I'm glad you're here. WHO country. You Tell me, it. is I am I right or is the dealer right? No, you are right for for two reasons, Bruce. One is uh, common business practice. You're right, but as far as the legal obligation of that of that uh, company, um, you're right with the dealer agreement that they have to perform the warranty work. Um, the caller from Iowa City mentioned something about oil changes. Um, Maybe at that particular dealership, they're using an oil change as a loss leader or some reason to get you in the door, and they might not prefer it. But as far as the warranty work goes, you're 100% right. Um, a dealer's got to take care of that. They're a licensed franchise dealer. And I would imagine that the, the uh, manufacturer would take a little bit of, of umbrage if you were to call the zone office and let them know about that. Because let's face it, that's what they advertise. No matter where you go, that's why you buy from us and so on and so forth. That's right. What we do at our store is mm -hmm. if uh, someone buys a car somewhere else, we offer them, say, hey, uh, we would love to have your service work because you'll never have a chance to sell them an automobile if you don't do their service right. work and vice versa. Well, apparently he went there, but he said he bought the car for 800 bucks less. $800, I think I'd go to another dealer too. For 50 bucks, 100 bucks, maybe 200, I might think a little bit about it, but 800, no, that's too much money. Well, service, uh, most dealers these days, and not all of them, but most dealers make every operation of their store uh, work independently. A profit center, sure. Yes, sir. And uh, service is no doubt one of them, but uh, he's just getting plain, good old-fashioned, bad service. That's just what it is. It's also a bad business, because he's going to spend, hey, it's a great new car, yeah, yeah but don't buy it down at Jolly's. You know, we, and I, that's, that's human nature. We, we spend, let's face it, if somebody does a good job, you may talk about it. They do a lousy job, you're going to talk about it. 
no question about that. I tell our salespeople who try to sell someone a car, and they might buy the same car from another Lincoln Mercury dealer. Mm -hmm. I say save face and tell them to come in and get their service work done here. We'd be glad to have it. Yeah, another shot at them next time. And what you also establish your relationship with people for a long time. That's when, right. When you're doing that, and, and people get used to going there, ah, hell, I'm going down there. Be, at least, at the very least, if they're going to buy another car that you vend, they're going to give you the first shot, which is worth something. Thank yeah, you very much. Right. I appreciate you calling, my friend. Thank, Thank you, Bruce. You. Iowa City, did you hear whether you heard all that, right? Yes, I did. Well, I think he's 100% right. Now. And these guys continue to give you a bad time. Your next stop should be the zone office. You know, I did call them. What did they say? I, I called the the, um, the the manufacturer's uh 800 number, the care number, or something in well, California. That's not, the, that's not the zone office. The zone office is right yeah. in your area. And the girl there said that she would just uh, sort of write it down and notch it up. And then when it came time to review the um, uh, contract with the dealer. That's a stupid answer. That doesn't help you. And, yeah. I, and I, I would tell her that's a stupid answer. Well, I don't want you to write it down. I want you to do something for yeah. me. Call the, if, if this guy gives you a bad time, call the zone office. If you don't know where that is, Call the guy you bought the car from and tell him you want the zone office for your area. They'll be glad to give it to you. Okay. I wish you well, guys. Thank you. Solange, Solange, Pennsylvania. Hello there. Hi, Tiger. Hello, baby. How are you? What is a Solange? Well, it's Solunga. Solunga? Yes, it's uh, shortened. Cucamonga, Solunga, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a shortened Indian name. It's local creek. It's Chicky Solunga. Chicky Solunga. And it means where crayfish dig in the mud. And um, it's been a jumping place ever since. Is that where is Salunga near adjacent to, or that anybody except somebody a Salunga ease had heard of? Seven miles west of Lancaster. Okay, that helps. Yeah. What's on your mind, baby? Well, an interesting um, situation. My 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 husband and I bought the house from my mom, and she and my dad had built the house in 1949. Okay. And we just bought it last July. All right. And I was talking to our neighbor who was erecting a new garage to mm -hmm. replace his old one. Sure. And he said, you know, the funniest thing happened. Now, he's been living in the house for probably 25 years. He said, you know, the funniest thing happened. He said, when I went down to the township office to, to see about replacing the garage, I found out that this strip of property in back of us that we were always told was a township right away isn't. Now, it says on our deeds that it's a right of way to the township, and we, we are responsible for mowing it. Um, and we can't, you can't erect a building or plant a tree in right, there. This is on your current deed, the one that you got. Yeah, in July of 94. Okay. Go ahead. The people on one side of us just bought their house um, probably in 93. Mm -hmm. And like I said, on the other side, um, they've been, hey, you've been here for a long time. Yeah. yeah, everybody's been here for a while. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, well, who does it belong to? Now, there's, the railroad runs in back of all the, of the it runs east and west, mm -hmm. parallel to the main drag. Mm -hmm. And your so the, your property runs north and south, exactly. it's rectangular. Go right. ahead. Um, and so there's a railroad right of way, and then there's a field, mm -hmm. and it's an empty field, and it's always been empty. Um, it's passed through various hands over the years. But what, they, go ahead. I'm sorry. What the township did was they gave this strip of right of way to the owner of this field. Well, what that's called is a vacation. It's not a gift. Okay. It's called a vacation, and I'll tell you why in just okay. a moment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Stick around. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. All righty, I'm talking with a lady in Salunga, Pennsylvania. Back of her property, there was a, a, what she thought was, I guess, we would call a paper street. And now she comes to find out, I guess, that the, the, the paper street is no longer there, and the property was, quote, given to the people on the other side of the street. Is that about the size of it? That works. Okay. It's ordinarily, <clears throat> if a community, for whatever reason decides they want to, uh, it's called vacation of street. Where the word came from, I guess they vacate their rights. Mm -hmm. They generally try to return the property whence it came. Now, as often as that not, that means they split it down the middle and half goes to one side and half goes to the other. Unless a search of the records indicates that it all came from one side and then it goes back to them. Even if it was like 50 years ago? Doesn't matter. Okay. Doesn't matter. Well, they, they, they would go back in the records and try to find out how they acquired that property. Okay. And if it was given or 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 taken from the owner of... The, see, the rights go with the property, not with people. If it came from the property across the street, then it would go back to them. Okay. So if I want to stop mowing it, I can stop mowing it. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you, uh, 
how wide is your property? Wide. Uh, Sixty feet. All right. How wide? So how we're talking about next to nothing in terms of of any interest act here. Right. You didn't have to mow it to begin with, by the way. Well, it's one of those. Well, if you don't things. if you don't mow, it looks like hell. That's yeah. why you mow it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and but but you and you could go back and find out why it was vacated in the fashion that it was. But I I, I would be willing to wager with at least even money that uh, initially fifty years ago that property came from the guy across the street and then and it was returned once it came. Well, I believe initially it was all owned by the same person who was my great uncle. Okay. Well, then we, okay. And and then my parents bought a lot from him and the people next to us bought a lot and my uncle bought a lot and built a house. Mm -hmm. So it was all divvied off of this this It was one piece that was subdivided. Right. But then it would have to be determined which of the subdivided pieces was the right away. Right. Uh, did it did it come from? Now, for example, if if your your great uncle, whoever it was, had whipped up three lots, yours and a couple of others that you talked about, mm -hmm. but owned all the property across the other side of this, mm -hmm. would, would be logical to take it off the one piece, okay. the whole lot cleaner. And yeah. from his point of view, it wouldn't matter really because he owned it all. Right. And. But that's, well, you can go back and, and have somebody do a search and find out. Well, the question I had, the, the way that it's set up like a lot of old towns where you have the houses along the main street and then there are alleys in yeah, back yeah, where you had the carriage house or garage or where right, you had right, right. And the idea was my husband and I had always sort of had in the back of our mind, maybe if we ever put a garage on, we put it back there and we could have this paper well, street. If that's been, if it's been vacated, my dear. We're stuck. Well, it's not a question of stuck. It just doesn't exist anymore. Okay. And that, that right of having access to the rear doesn't exist. I would, But if you want to search and find out why it happened, that shouldn't be too hard to do either. I do wish you well. I'm Bruce Williams. Thank you so much for the hour, kids. This is TalkNet. Well, hello there. Hey, I am really pleased you're here. I'm Bruce Williams, and of course, this is TalkNet. We talk to you and about you. You're the focal point. We talk about your life and maybe how we can make some positive changes if such a call for. Fair enough? Glad you're here. I'm Bruce Williams for TalkNet. Our telephone number, 800 743 800-743-8000, from anywhere in, on, or around North America. The number's good right now, or if you prefer, 10 o'clock to about 12.45 in the morning. Dan and I will be here whipping those calls on to the little magic tape for broadcast at a later date. So either way, you're invited to participate. 800-743-8000. You're also invited to drop me a card, Bruce Williams, Bruce, South Dakota. If you agree with my position on making the postmark adequate uh, demonstration that you paid, your bills on time. If you drop me up with me, you can't remember lying your neighbor, you gotta do it. Just drop me a postcard. We'll see that the congressional delegation gets some numbers impress them. You might want to put on that postcard too. Uh, Mr. Congressman, I vote and I'll remember. Alrighty, we're gonna begin the festivities in Indianapolis, Indiana. Hello there. Hello, Bruce. How are you this evening? I couldn't be better, guy. Love your show. Thank you. Got a business question for you. Yes, sir. I work for a small uh, high tech company and uh as with any small company, we've got a lot of receivables. And uh, ownership came to me today and asked me if uh, if I could lend them some money. You gotta be kidding! No, this is a very small company, huh? Uh, yeah. Well, not huge. How many employees? About thirty. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And the boss came to you and said he wants and eats bread, huh? For a little while, yeah. How much and for how long? And how long you've been there? And what do you know about? Them? I've been there about four years. All right. And uh, they want about 50K. You know them to be honorable and all that stuff? Very much. All right. Um, you you know have the, do you have the 50? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, they're, they're almost extended family. All right. As far as relationship goes. I uh, know the company. Um, been there quite a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm leaning towards doing it because I do trust them. Right. And I, I do have a strong feeling about the company. Mm -hmm. My concern is protection of myself. Well, what can they give you? as security for your loan. That's what it comes down to. What do I ask for? Well, the moon. How about their first, second, third born child? I don't, well, want, that. I don't want them. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's start with real estate. Do they have any? Yeah, they've got real estate. Well, can you take a mortgage on the real estate? That's possible. If the mortgage, if the real estate is already mortgaged, is there sufficient equity to justify a second mortgage? Do they have machinery of any kind? Equipment, whatever. 
does the does the machine is the machinery free and clear? Is that uh, favorable? You know, is it decent collateral? You can and and you can sub collateralize with stock in the corporation. Do they have other securities which they may or may not own? It's a lot of things. Get, my, think, get my fingers on something. Oh, a lot of somethings. Yeah. Personal IOUs, personal checks that might be dated well, not, for a not, time. No, 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 no. But personal guarantees, of course. You're not just loaning money to the corporation. You're loaning to them as individuals. And you're saying that's a good thing or a bad thing? What, loaning the money? Yeah. Well, I think loaning the money is up to you. I don't know if they're good or bad. No, but the, the personal guarantee. Oh, they're a, a requisite from your perspective. Okay, yeah. Absolute requisite. Well, from their perspective, I'm not so sure I'd feel that way. I'd say loan it to the company. They, they've, they've offered the personal guarantee. And what, what kind of interest are we willing to pay? I don't know. But you see, the point is, why come to you? Why not go to a traditional lender? Well, I tell you what the answer is. They can't go to a traditional lender because they won't lend them any money. Uh, not true. Uh, working, well, with a, working with a lender right now. And, uh, well, then why would they come to you? What's, what's really, I mean... They, they, need, they need about a 15-day stopgap until, the, until uh, the, the lender is able to give them their answer. Well, what, what, what happens? Suppose the answer is no. Uh, the, 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 the way the AR right now is a, a large chunk of it is due within 30 days. Uh, we had a, we had a gangbuster month about you a month ago. You mean the receivable should be? What did I say? Yeah. You, yeah, you said yeah. it's due. But, well, but what is, who's the, I, mean, I don't mean specifically by name, but what's the relationship with this lender? Is it the bank? Yes. Oh, yes. Well, why is it taking the banks two weeks to make up their mind to loan you money? Most banks will give you an answer in 24 hours. Can't answer you. I don't well, know. Well, that's a, that's a good. Find out. It's a good question to ask. Yes, it is. You see, I'm not so sure you, you you responded very quickly, and I'm not criticizing you. When people start to go to their employees for money, they are in trouble. Now, maybe you're doing more business than you should. I don't know that. That'll happen when your receivables get ahead of you. And of course, there are companies that are in business just to take care of that possibility. They're called factors. Uh huh. Where they buy receivables? I'm 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 relatively certain that that this situation was was achieved by uh, outselling a little bit. Mm-hmm. Which, well, which which can happen. Well, this is a nice problem to have. Yes, it is. But the point is that I don't hold you. I'm 31. Well, you've been around long enough to understand that people can be awfully over optimistic as to their ability to pay. Understood. And uh, with the risk, I don't want to patronize you. But you sound a tad, tad gullible. I, I could be, and and and, 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 and you, frankly, you're blinded by your by your personal relationship, and then you have to be criticized for that. Very well, could be. And in in this situation, uh, you know, a lot of situations, I, I'm I'm confident in this one. I'm not. So I, I you, in, indeed, well, we I, and I, I'm not suggesting you're not competent. Oh no! But no, no. when you're when you get awfully close, it's like when when parents are thinking about loaning money to their kids, they lose their objectivity to some extent. And what I'm, what I'm leaving you with is, if there's hesitation on the part of a commercial lender, then you at least ought to look at the thing 14 different ways. Saying you shouldn't help out. Mm -hmm. But you gotta look at it and, and you make certain it's secure. For, if they give you a, a, a second mortgage on their factory, if they've got one, right? Uh -huh. It's not worth a damn unless the equity is there. I understood. And these are things that people, <laughs> but I can tell you how many people I've talked to that gave second mortgages and there wasn't any equity. The sure, they got the mortgage, but what good is it? Right, yeah. That's okay. what I'm telling you. Get them tied up pretty tight. Okay. Be a, be a nice guy, but not too nice. Uh, I don't think at 31 you got a long gray beard, do you? No. Well, I don't want you to act like Santa Claus then. No, 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 no. No, and I don't. That's 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 my reason for calling you. What do I watch out good. for? Or what get, a, I... get them tied up tight. Okay. I, 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 I understand what you mean by that. I, I wish you well, my friend. I'm Bruce Williams, and I'm delighted you're here. This is TalkNet. Laurel, Maryland. Hello there. Welcome to TalkNet. Good evening. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing real well, thank you. Uh, I had a question. Um, I've never owned a home before, and I'm looking at um, townhomes and condominiums out here in uh, Maryland. Yeah. And uh, right now, I'm renting a home for about eight seventy-five a month. Not a home, but renting a apartment for about eight seventy-five a month in this uh, area. Mm -hmm. And what I was wondering is, with the townhome or condominium. They uh, kind of own the well. They don't. They do own the property around it, but they don't own the condominium itself. How does that affect property taxes? Well, yeah. you pay you pay taxes 
both through your your uh, condo association and you pay them directly as well. Oh, so you do pay to the state as well. Oh, has a cat got whiskers? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you betcha. Maybe the city too. All right. All right. No, I, I was asking because I wasn't uh, You sure don't pay taxes that. to the state, by the way. Okay. You pay taxes to the city and county. The city and county. And yeah, then you, pay. you don't pay this tax. The state uh, is not, does not collect real estate taxes in any jurisdiction of which I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm accustomed to be, doing, be in. But the city see, does. What, what do you think about does. an investment as far as buying a townhouse? or? I'm not sure it's an investment as such. Look, you've you, you got to start thinking about houses in a different, in a different context than, than, than a lot of people are accustomed. Okay. They are, you're, it's an investment in a way of life. As contrasted with, I'm going to make money on this. You may lose money. All right. Now, and if you, if you let me let, let's let me. I, I want to try to get a, get a kind of a, a, a handle on your mindset. Okay. All right. Suppose you paid. Well, how much are these things? Somewhere in your area. Oh, the cheapest is in about the ninety-two thousand dollar range. Well, you can rent cheaper than you can own. Let's start with that. Okay. No question about that. All right. If that's the price. How much is the one you're in right now? Oh, the, the apartment I'm in? If you wanted to buy it. If, if I it, wanted to buy this? Or, oh, buy, or put another way, maybe this. If, if you wanted to buy a comparable facility, what would it cost? Say a number of rooms, that kind of stuff, the accoutrements. Yeah, a little more. Yeah. How much? Uh, probably probably somewhere between 900 and 1000 a month. That's well, without utilities or anything. Well, like I'm that. Trying, then it's cheaper to rent. Right. Now, having having said all, all of that, uh, if I if you said to me or I said to you, look, you bought a place for pick a number, hundred thousand dollars, okay, and three years from now you sold it for a hundred thousand, or maybe ninety eight thousand, we'll say, would you say you lost money in that deal? Mm, yes, I would say you didn't. Right, because you lived there for three years. You can't discount the fact that you had a lifestyle for three years. You see. True. Well, there are a lot of people who would look at it. Oh, I lost my shirt. I expected to sell it for 120. Well, that's just not going to happen in today's world anymore. Okay. Some property is going to go up. Some is going to go down. It used to be automatic up. No more. Well, some of it is too. Is uh, we're trying to get equity, as we've never owned. Yeah, but you may not get any equity. You may not. Uh -huh. Yeah, because suppose you uh, you buy a place as I have done for for a certain number of dollars, and all of a sudden it's worth uh, two thirds of that. Oh my. Oh my. Happened to me. Yeah, I guess, and I guess I uh, happened to tens of thousands of people. I see. Even in this area, you think? I'm oh, it's particularly tall. in that area. Oh, particularly in yes, this sir. Area. A lot of people have been burned in that greater. I'm talking about the greater Washington area. Right, we're we're near I that. Know, I know exactly where you are. Oh yeah. A lot of people have been burned in that area, and people have made money too. Probably you see, buying homes, well, there's just there's too many variables. You know, if, they, if somebody throws up another thousand condos, all of a sudden people want to buy new. They don't want to buy quote used. True. Uh, I remember buying a condo for 105 grand strictly as an investment. Right. I could have flipped it the next day for 150. The next day. But old greedy here, I was only going, you know, pig pig, right? Right. Uh, next day, I turn around. Well, they'll make a long story short. I sold it for about 105 after I had all kinds of expenses. Oh my! Oh, yeah. happened. I was glad to get out for 105. I probably lost about 25,000 on a deal. Now, um, as compared to homes, uh, is it about? Is it the same thing? Are no. we talking? We're you've talking. You got a better thing. shot at a home appreciating or getting out whole. Right. You got a better shot at a, as a, a freestanding home. We're talking about. Okay. You got a better shot in most areas, but that could change. Yeah. That could change. Okay. I do wish you well, guy. Thank you. Nothing is certain. That's a cinch. So you're buying lifestyle. From Laurel, Maryland to Peoria, hello there. Hi. I'm hey. glad to talk to you. Well, I'm so glad you took the time to call, my dear. What's on your mind? I have a few questions about a car accident I had. Mm -hmm. um, I've never been involved in an accident with injuries before, mm -hmm. so I have some questions about me and a couple questions about the car. All right. The car um, is I owe seven thousand dollars on it, and it's worth blue book price of seven thousand. Mm -hmm. And there, it was repairable, and they're repairing it. So the question I have is: it was a front end collision, it has over four thousand dollars worth of damage. Mm. After it's repaired. Do you think I would be wise to just sell it? Well, it depends on it. I, I had a, a car. This is now, my golly, I hate to admit how many years, 11 years ago. But I had a very bad front end 
like about seven, eight thousand dollars in damage. Mm-hmm. And the, but the car was at that time worth fifteen or twenty, whatever, a lot more than that. Yeah. And uh, I drove it certainly at one hundred and twenty thousand. Then one of my kids drove another forty or fifty thousand. After that. Hmm. So the reason I ask the question is, people say I've heard people say once. You have front end damage. Forget it. It'll That's never be the same true. car. That is just not true. Oh, really? Okay. No, man. Now, that, I... doesn't, that doesn't mean it isn't difficult to correct. Don't misunderstand me. And it, depending upon the type of frame you have and whatever, but it can be corrected if it's done appropriately. Okay. No, but I'm not going to tell you it's going to get done for you correctly. I can tell you, in my case, it was, and, and I, I ran the car for, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm sure I don't remember the exact. It's been a while now. It was over a hundred thousand miles after I had the accident, and my. One of my sons drove it certainly 40 or 50 after that. Okay, all right. Okay, the other question I have about the car is somebody told me that once you have a front-end collision, you should replace the seatbelt. Have you ever heard of that? No, ma'am, I have not. Okay, car dealer had never heard of it either. Well, that's, then there's two of us that have Okay. Heard. Where do people get all this this, this, this inside info? Tell me. <laughs> I don't know, but you get a lot of advice when you have a car accident. Oh, I guess you do. <laughs> Okay, one more question. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have some injuries from this. They're not really terribly severe, but I do have some. Mm-hmm. Um, the way I understand it, people tell me that the <laughs> the other <There> lady, <laughs> the other lady's insurance company is going to call me out of the blue and offer me some money. Maybe and yes, then, maybe no. And then other people have told me, "Oh, don't wait for that. Go run and get yourself a lawyer." Maybe yes, maybe no. Let's talk about the the extent of your injuries for a moment, because that's certainly a, a factor here. How well, uh, uh, how do we measure injuries? Well, as one way is what have so far. How long ago did this happen? Ten days ago. Uh, the year that it's too early to even think about it. This whole is nonsense. But uh, well, have you 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 have obviously seen a physician or more than one. Um, I went to the hospital that night, and then I've since seen the, a physician once. All right. Do you plan on seeing him again? Yes. Is what what other injuries? It's just, just like back, shoulder, neck stuff, plus the real ex- extensive bruising. Mm-hmm. Well, we, the one one rule of thumb, which is not something that's etched in any in stainless steel, mm-hmm. is whatever medical bills you have three times that number. I'm assuming that the other lady was at fault. Is that a fair assumption? Correct. Okay, that may be something to deal with there, but I wouldn't even think about it for six months. Just to make sure that I don't really have that's right. That's, that's exactly right. You don't know right now. Nobody seems to. Nobody would know. Okay. And, and they very and you may very well be approached by the other insurance company. And I'd say I'm just not prepared to do anything just now. Thank you very much. If you'll leave your card, I will be in touch. And at some point, then do I initiate a contact? If they don't. Yeah. Yeah. It's not with the insurance company. Wait, your claim. Who? Your claim is not against the insurance company. Your claim is against that woman. So at some point, if I don't hear from them and I feel like I'm you done con- being you, taken care right, of, I you call contact her. contact her and you can say, if you wish, you can put me in touch with your insurance company. If she says no, then you sue her. I see. Okay. Just so at least so until bad. that point, I don't need to get a lawyer? No, ma'am. I not, see. I have not, not in this case. Okay. If, if there were very severe injuries and some no, other no, no, variables, no. but I don't see that happening. No, I don't think at this point, this is one you can probably settle with yourself. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And listen, let's not go out and have any more of these things. Oh, gosh, I hope not. It scared, <laughs> scared the life out of me. Well, it's nothing to be scared about. Well, it hurt. <laughs> well, that's another program. <laughs> I wish you well. Thank you. We go out to Kona, Hawaii, on the Big Island. Hello there. Hi, Bruce. How you doing? Uh, aloha. Aloha. <laughs> I've got a business question for you. Yes, ma'am. I currently own a business uh, in Kona, and um, I'm at. I have a copy center, and I'm adding on to my business a shipping and mailbox section. Mm-hmm. And so I hired two part-time employees to assist me with this endeavor. They were experienced, and then I just received a letter from a lawyer that these employees are in violation of their contract with their previous employer, who is a well-known franchise. Well, franchise they, in they, they, they may very well have signed a non-compete. Okay, so yes, I, I received a copy of what they signed, and it mm-hmm. said that they, after two years from their date of termination, that they are not allowed to engage directly or indirectly in uh, a competition. Now, let me ask you this. Did they leave the other company, or did the other company leave them? They, oh. Were they fired, or did they quit? One of them, I know, uh, she told me it was a mutual thing, so mutual I Mutual don't, don't do it. That's That's quitting. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, okay. The other, the other one? 
I I assume that that uh, I I don't know. I guess I should ask her. I I don't know. It's pretty tough to enforce a non compete if you're fired. Mm. But if it's other if and I didn't say it's impossible. I said tough to enforce. Uh huh. But if you left voluntarily, then it very definitely if it's not an unreasonable non compete, and certainly in a town as small as Kona, it would not be unreasonable to say you can't compete with us here. I would suggest that you talk to your attorney and let him be guiding you. I'm Bruce for TalkNet. Richmond, VA, hello there. Hello, Bruce. So nice to hear you. Well, thank you very much. I can't usually listen to you here. Why not? Well, I don't can't find you on the radio. I used to live in the Midwest and heard you, and so anyway, I've got a problem, and that's why I wanted to call you up. Oh, son of a gun. We're going to find out why you can't find me in Richmond. We're around there somewhere. Well, I hope so. Anyway, the reason I'm calling is that I'm probably going to be involved in helping my son-in-law finance uh, a business proposition. Hmm. He wants to buy his father's concession that he runs in a nonprofit organization. What, and could it's you be a little more successful. specific? It's a, basically a bar. A bar? What, a bar in a, not like a, in a VFW post or something? Yeah, that type of thing, yes. All right. And it's quite successful. He's had it for a long time, well, probably 20, 30 years. Huh. Um, and my son, and he wants to retire. The, the father wants to retire, and my son-in-law it wants to take it over. He's been working there for a number of years. Okay, the employee. father will not carry the paper? Well, I'm not sure what we're going to do about that yet. Um, that's all in discussion. But what I want to know is, how do you determine really the price of something like this? It's, well, what is it we're getting? We're not getting any physical property. Well, you're not getting the land, not getting the building, but you're going to get a, like oh, the cooler to put the, uh, yeah, all, the all stuff in and the inventory and, and uh, stainless it's, steel power. Aside from the inventory, that's all we're talking about. The rest that's of right. stuff's worth nothing. Uh -huh. and, that's right, and I, I think, you know, it nets around 70000 hmm. Um how, how much effort is that to, to put it to make that seventy grand? Well, uh, let's take the, and, and I don't mean your son-in-law. He's been paid a salary. I assume that's, when they, when they see 70, it's what the father has been taken out of the business. Is that a fair assumption? Yeah, the 70 is the net. Is that what you mean? That's what the, after he pays his son, right. after he pays everything else. That's Sorry. correct. Yeah. So what we, whether it's your son-in-law or somebody else, that slot's filled by another body. I want to know right. how much effort or time, let's call him, let's say the father, the owner, we'll call him the owner. How much time is the owner putting in right now? Right now he's not putting in a lot of time. That's a very hard way to determine. What does that well, I mean? I don't really know, but he doesn't work 40 hours a week. He works right. a few days. The then way I understand it. Mm -hmm. I don't have all the facts, but what I was asking you for, too, is to help me. Well, that's know. an important variable. Okay, the effort. The less time he works, the more valuable it is. Okay. If he didn't work at all and get 70 grand a year just per, because he owns it, that's one thing. Let's take the other extreme. If he works 100 hours a week and gets to 70,000, that's quite another, isn't it? Yeah, no, he does not do well, that. No, no, I yeah. understand that. I right. gave you two ridiculous extremes. Right. And I'd like, you're okay. going to have to figure out where so, he is in the middle of that. Okay. So that's uh, secondly, what is his relationship with a nonprofit? Is it contractual or on a handshake or what? Yeah, no, it's a written lease, sign, a signed lease for, for a number long? of years. Well, how many years? Um, at the moment, it's uh, my son-in-law would be able to take over the four years that are on his father's lease yeah. and then be also um, extended for five more years. Oh, he's got a five option. Yes. Four, so a total of nine years. Yes. Okay. Well, when you find out how much inventory, how much effort he puts into it, it may start being, assuming that the lease is assignable, then we can come up with some kind of a number. Okay, well... And is, they, uh, all right, I'm sorry. Is there any... There's no particular formula no like ma'am there surely isn't and you see there's so many variables one of the one of the variables uh is paper if you want all cash for something uh -huh. more often than not you'll get a whole lot less than if you were prepared to carry some paper okay and apparently the father is is or is not well, we haven't determined that. Well, I understand yet. that, but that's but these are variables that you have before you can talk numbers. Right, right, okay. If you could buy that business for nothing down, uh huh, it would be worth a ton more than if you wanted cash. Okay. Probably, probably near twice as much. 
Okay. Because the guy's sticking his neck out. Mm-hmm. One of the other things I, that I'm concerned about is after the lease runs out, what do you do? Suppose it would not be... Um, and you're stuck. It's goodbye. Yeah, and you kind of like lose it all, possibly. Well, what do you lose? Yes, the only thing you lost is... The, all, your, all this guy is selling is, is the inventory, which can be worked out the next to nothing. Uh-huh. And the lease, the equipment, it all, it, if the equipment's worth 2000 bucks, worth a lot. Okay. Used equipment has almost no, used bar, I'm in the bar business. Okay. Used bar equipment is worth almost nothing. Okay. So what you're buying is the, is the, the right to do business here, that's all. Okay. And whatever inventory there is. Okay. Which can be spent right down. Okay. All right. Um, well, that's somewhat helpful for me. But there, there is no magic formula, dear. Okay. I wish you well. Okay, thanks. Good luck. But the, the one thing I should have mentioned to you is be very careful. If you're going to finance this, I know you love your son-in-law and you love your daughter, but tie them up as tight as a shoe. Newton, Iowa. Hello there. Hi, how are you tonight? I'm just fine, thank you. Glad to hear it. Say, uh, I wanted to call. I was just... I was driving down the road here, and I heard the woman's call about the seat belts and replacing them. Yes. And I pulled out my owner's manual and looked, and it says that after a major collision, the seat belts and all hardware should be replaced. Hmm. I think that is as much a liability proposition as anything else. Well, it's when you, if you look at a seat belt, I guess, and you look at uh, thin metal, and you put a tremendous strain on a seat belt, as I'm sure you can attest. Well, where's the thin metal, though? Well, in the in the buckle. Where the seat belt is sewn, where it's attached to the floor. Okay, I suppose that's well. I'm not sure. <laughs> I describe that as real thin, but your you, you, your point is well taken. That that it can, and maybe that 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 could be damp. I certainly would would want to take a look at it. I give you that. Oh sure, and it but, may not need replaced, but uh, rather safe than sorry. I mean, you're spending five thousand. What's yeah, a couple hundred more? I don't disagree, but you see that the, I I have to believe that in some in some of those things, it's as much a, a liability answer as it is a real answer i don't disagree with you yeah we, we are so so attuned to somebody suing us i mean you, you're always looking over your shoulder which is kind of a sorry commentary isn't it yes. but i but i do appreciate your account I, I had never i guess i haven't read my owner's manual i had never heard of replacing the seatbelt routinely and i have never replaced the seatbelt i must tell you and of course in the, in the one case <laughs> you just take the seatbelt that was probably the only thing that was salvageable in that airplane i'm bruce williams good this is talk that oh myra new york danny says i should talk to you immediately uh, bruce it's hard to believe i got through to you well it's easy Tell to do. everybody's the hag in there they'll make it sometime super what can we do for you bruce i'm a licensed real estate agent. All right. I owned a home, two units, and I sold it as being uh, separate utilities. I'm sorry? I had separate, I, I listed it as being separate oh, yeah. utilities. Different, me different meters, one for each side. Right. Was that the case? Up and down. Yeah. At the time I sold it, I paid for gas and electric. I paid for the whole thing. On both sides? Right. But there were two separate bills, though. Yes. Yes, right. If, if I walked up there and said, last March, what did side A cost? You could flip to the bills and say, oh, yeah, here's this bill for side A, right? Right. I did this uh, about one year before I sold it. Yeah, but what I'm trying to get to is there were a separate and distinct meters, heat, the whole works. Correct. Okay. Everything. Gas and electric, both separate. Okay. Up and down. It, it was up and down unit. All right. Well, anyway, after I sold it, uh, the party I sold it to, they came back and they found that the wires were a little fouled up. Oh. Upstairs was on the downstairs and downstairs was on the upstairs, <laughs> which I had no idea this was uh, happening. Uh-huh. That's the, you, this is not the first time that's happened. Right. Well, anyway, they're taking me to test now. Why? They're calling up my uh, multiple listing office and they're trying to get me to... I, I don't know what to pay for her uh, changing around and everything, which it, it sounds like a, a really uh, a awesome amount of money. Why would it now, be an awesome? Are the, meter, are the meters sitting side by side? Yes, on the outside of the building. 
and they well, wait have, a minute. Why why would you just not read the other meter? No, she wants me to pay for what breaking is to, out the wires. What's to be paid? If you're telling me that meter A is supposed to be upstairs, right, and meter B is supposed to be downstairs, right. All right, so you start reading B for downstairs, and the other just reverse your reading. No, no, some of the wires are fouled up. Well, what in what way? Well, okay. Now, in other words, are you telling me you some of the off, off all the wires for upstairs? Yeah. Uh, you still have uh, the upstairs meter going around and around because. Uh, in other words, you're saying you're saying that, that st stuff from both sides comes into both different meters. Right. They, uh, the the certain it could be the, the electrician did it, and uh, he didn't do a very good job. Clearly. So uh, I don't know if you. Re I don't know if you're responsible for something that you weren't aware of. Bruce, that, I can say that she well, didn't request uh, an inspection. Well, that has nothing to do with anything. Okay. The fact is, you had to fill out a disclosure sheet. I did. All right. Now they, they, and and the, the thing is, let's assume for the sake of discussion that there's a huge sinkhole 30 feet under your house, ready to suck the house right down the sinkhole. If you don't know about it, you can't tell them about it. You cannot tell about what you don't know. Right. Now, if you can honestly say you had no idea that this condition existed, I don't know that you can be held responsible for it. If, on the other hand, they could come up with Charlie uh, Jones, the, the local electrician, and said, oh, yeah, Henry called me about that. It's a real mess, but he didn't want to spend the money. That's a different program, you said. No, the... The electrician. No, 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 no. I'm just what I'm trying to get to is that you forget about how it happened for the moment. Mm -hmm. the, what, the, as I understand it, I could be totally mistaken, but as I understand it, the question is, did you know? And you're telling me absolutely no. I'll bet my I'll swear my firstborn child's life I didn't know. Is that correct? That's right. I Hold I it. Stop right there. Stop right there. Right. At that point, I don't think you can be held responsible. I could be mistaken. What she did, she took and uh, made a complaint to my multiple listing. And That's they're trying fine. to get me to go up there and pay money. I understand that. Myself, you're, we're, which we're, I don't like to do it because I, I didn't do anything wrong. What do you mean? Is, is she in court with you? No. Then you have, what do you have to spend any money for? Because multiple listing... Uh, Tell multiple reason. listing that you gave them an honest answer. I did. And well, I tried to explain That's it. it. You're not, they can't re compel you to do anything unless they take an action in court. Oh, absolutely. Then don't go. That's why, that was my opinion also. Now, you and may I get a letter. Well, you may I get a letter. You and I respect all the... Well, I'm only... Look, I don't know. I, you may get a letter from an attorney. Well, Demand I, I would. I, I told her, I told the party to uh, take me to court. I said, then we get this whole thing straight. Well, oh, that's fine. But she's need... not going that way. She's well, going. She's trying to lose my license for uh, being a licensed real estate. Um, I don't. You 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 acknowledge the fact that you were a you were a real estate agent, did you not? To that, I did because you're required to do that. Right. You also filled out a form. And tell she she can't have your license. She can't have your license. She acted on that base. I don't believe. Uh, she's trying that. Well, I know too. she's trying. Yeah. But but if, if, if there's, if, lady if there's a out. hearing of some kind, I hope she's listening to this program. Right, if there is a hearing of some kind, then you should be represented by counsel. But until you're forced into some kind of a situation, say, I'm very sorry, I told the truth. Mm -hmm. I did. Well, that's it. I do wish I, you well. I right. respect your opinion. Well, uh, you. It goes along with mine, but I wasn't sure. Well, the, the ball is very firmly in her court. We'll have, to see what, we'll have to see what she does. That's what it comes down to. And then you can respond in kind. I'm Bruce Williams, and I am truly pleased that you're part of this thing. This thing we call TalkNet. SYR Country, Syracuse. Hello there. Good evening, Bruce. How are you tonight? Just fine, thank you. I really enjoy your show. Thank you. I want your opinion on something here. Uh, about a little over a month ago, I left a company I'd worked for for a little over, uh, about almost five years. Mm -hmm. And I left on good terms. You left because you wanted to leave? You left because they wanted you to leave? I left because I wanted to leave. All right. And they, they, they were good to me all the time I worked there. The only gripe I had is that uh, I wasn't even considered for any promotions. I guess I was doing too good a job at what I was doing. Mm -hmm. But 
that's not what I'm calling about. What I had was uh, I was a traveling uh, field service person, and I had a company credit card. And right now, there's about $800 that I need to pay on this credit card. And You need to pay because they were your personal expenses? Or? No, they were business-related, but I was reimbursed for these. Okay. And that's just how they worked it. I had a company credit card. You know how that goes. Yes. So uh, anyway, I had every intention of paying it, and what we're, I couldn't, uh, what we're arguing over is three and a half days vacation pay that all of a sudden they seem that I don't have coming to me. And I don't want to get a bad credit rating over three and a half days. Well, let's start with something. You don't, you do not have the right to withhold the credit card payment because you have an altercation or a disagreement about another issue. Well, that's what I well, be, well let's, let's stop right there. Sure. Because that's the answer. You guaranteed that you would pay this bill when you signed each one of those credit cards. That's correct. Actions. That's the end of the story. Okay. Well, there is one other thing in here. Hmm. Um, I had some paper sent to me at the time I announced that I was leaving the company. Yeah. And what it stated was that the, any credit that was not paid up at the time of departure, yeah. the, the local office would be responsible for that money. What does that mean? It's kind of vague, and I, um, what, well, what does it mean is that uh, my, the department that I used to work for would be responsible for well, picking up that tab. If well, I didn't yeah, pay it. that doesn't mean if you didn't pay it. That's right. That's what it said. What it said was that if there are outstanding charges, uh, they have to be settled before I leave, mm -hmm. and if they're not, arrangements can be made to take them out of my last paycheck or paychecks, depending on whatever. Right. And I have gotten all my paychecks uh, mm -hmm. that the, the people I was dealing with in payroll didn't know about. Well, it doesn't doesn't change anything. No. The fact is that they say you saw you you had a credit card. That's correct. The bill goes to them or to you. The uh, bill comes right to me. And then you're responsible for it. Period. Yeah, I. Now you got it's your it's now you got to try to collect from them. That's another story. Yeah, that's that's another program, like you say. Exactly, but but it, it, I, I mean, it's not a question of well, you know, it's a little gray, a little hard to figure. No, I, I own is, the money. I it was, was absolutely if nothing. I had any string here to pull on. I have one other question yeah. for you. Mm -hmm. Um, in this vein, what? And and I, I intend to pay this now after talking to you. But what do credit card companies do? It's only been a month, and that's not a problem. But how long generally do they wait before it becomes an issue? Depends on what kind of credit card it is. Um, if it's a bit, if it's a travel and leisure card, they make it an issue right away. If it's a, a a bank card, Visa, Mastercard, Discover, one of those cards, they are because they are set up where you can pay it on installments. They are perhaps a little easier to get along with. Okay, if I don't. A, if, if it's American Express, Carte Blanche, one of those guys, which do not extend credit, they they are due when presented then they are going to get testy right away. Okay, because I don't have a scratch in my credit rating, and I'd like to keep it that way. Well, yeah, and you've agreed. Yes, I have. That you owe the money, so you may as well pay it. But I just wanted to know. And then you go down and talk to them about getting reimbursed. Is there any question about your being reimbursed? The see, the vacation is a sidebar. Is yeah, there any it's just the way they allocate it is what happens so early in the year, and... In my opinion. Well, but that's a separate issue. I'm asking about the credit card. Okay. This 800 bucks. Right. Is there any question that they will accept responsibility for that $800? The company I worked for? Yes. Yeah, they might. Because. Well, why? I thought it was kind of strange, Bruce. The paperwork that I got prior to my exit interview stated yeah. that my supervisor was in charge of getting this money collected. If not, he would be billed. Well, well and the ex there never was an exit interview. He called me up over the phone. Well, that's another program. Yeah. You found them to be honorable in most ways. You worked there for over four years. I'd pay the bill, submit the voucher to them. Or submit the voucher and tell them you want to pay the bill. Either way, but I'd get it paid because it will wind up on your credit on your credit history. Thanks for the hour, campers. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. East Coast, coast of Florida, Saturday morning. I was on flying four days out of five this week. Boy, what a great vacation that would be. Thank you very much. <laughs> if this is your idea of... Well, you're 26, I can tell. Yeah. If this is your idea of vacation, please leave me home. <laughs> okay. Let me see. It'd be, uh, round numbers two and a half, 
five and a half. That's 11, 12, 13, 14, 17 hours this week on airplanes. Oh, I don't think I'd like that. That's a vacation. <laughs> a vacation, never mind. I'm going to make a smart remark. But the point is, I may not get back to you in, right away is what I'm trying to get to you. Okay. I will look at it tomorrow if you'll fax it off tomorrow morning. That I promise you. And if I get back to you real quick, I will because this is a little different twist. In the meantime, mm -hmm. in the meantime, yeah. if it were me, yeah. I would you, see the, the credit card company is going to tell you there's nothing you can do now okay. until you get your bill. And then what? Then you put it in contest, say that they, you were misrepresented, because I think you have been. Oh, it's just, okay. That because nobody can give you $1,000 for a $400 purchase. It cannot be. That's what I thought. Now, it may be that, that you'll find out that if you buy $20 million worth of flowers, you get four thousand, you get 1000 bucks. <laughs> That's a possibility. That's oh. a twist that they may put on this. I'm just thinking out loud. Okay. That may be one of the spins, or if you stay in a hotel until you're 93 and a half years old and you're, you know, <laughs> Pregnant with twins, no. then maybe. <laughs> uh, make a triplet. So twins are possible. You're only 93. You know what I'm saying. They're, 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 these conditions may apply. I don't know that. Okay. But let me take a look at the stuff. And uh, uh, I promise you this. I will get back to you in the next 30 days. How is that? That sounds great. Okay, baby. Thanks. To be continued. I mean, hey, that's a new twist. But I, I'm I, in, in thinking about this, I'll bet you that there may be. I don't bet because I don't know. Uh, I seldom wager unless I know. But there's a good possibility of maybe some minimum purchase requirements in order to qualify. Oh, Bruce Williams. Well, by the way, if you know this one, you've already taken the hook, give me a call. 703-413-8381. 703-413-8381. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Sioux Center, Iowa. Hello there. Welcome to my world. Hi, Bruce. I've been a long-time listener, and I'm a first-time caller. Well, very happy. Took the time, kid. What's up? Well, I think uh, we bought a vacuum. I should say I know we bought a vacuum uh -huh. in our house from a salesman. Uh -huh. And uh, we got the vacuum. We signed the papers and everything. And now here a couple days later, I started looking at them, and it's really not what we uh, thought it was going to be. It's gonna what be did you think it was going to be? <laughs> we thought... The, well, first of all, the price, we thought it was going to be about $1,800, $800, and it turns out to be about 1500 uh. So it ended up costing us more, and, it, and to, be, to top it all off, it doesn't work as well as we thought it would. Well, it, right, let's, let's take a very deep breath. <laughs> this guy came to your house, is that correct? Yep, that's true. Right. And this today is 24 November, if I'm not mistaken. October. Yep, that's correct. What day... And d day and date did he come to your home? I have my calendar on a wall here. I'm staring. What day? 10-17, Thursday. Oh, oh sorry, seven. sorry. I looked at November. <laughs> Let's look at October. 10-20. Uh, well, you got That's a problem. Thursday also. You have three business days. Three business days. So that'll be the 21st. Is one business day. Okay. You, but I think tomorrow is your third day. Oh, okay. The 25th. I believe it's one day to the 21st. One day. Yeah, I think tomorrow is the last day, 25th. Mm-hmm. That you have to notify them in writing. In yeah. writing. In writing. Now, they had to give you a thing that told you how to do that, did they? Well. No, uh, hold it. Yeah, Don't to me a wells. They are obliged by law to give you... A piece of paper that tells you in some detail that you have a 72-hour right of rescission. Mm -hmm. And it's over 50 bucks when the sale was made in your home. Is that true? That's true. And they got to give you that by law. Is it there in your papers? On the, bottom, on the bottom of the contract, it does have a three-day... What does it say specifically? Uh, I don't have it right here in front of me. Well, you got to do exactly what that tells you. Okay. And, that, and I don't mean short Verbatim. Verbatim. <laughs> Now you're laughing. Could cost you eighteen hundred bucks, and I'll laugh. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it can cost you a lot of money. Uh huh. So you've got to do it the way they tell you to do it, and but and be certain that you have some way to prove that you did what you said. Okay. That's very important. So everything in in writing, and have proof of what I did. That's correct. And you got to do it tomorrow. Tomorrow. Not the next day. Okay. Today is Monday, isn't it? I have to look at my watch for mm -hmm. I figure out what day it is anymore. Well, then you got to do it tomorrow. You have three business days okay. in order to do this. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday don't count. Okay. 
But how did you get yourself talked into this? The guy's pretty well, good, huh? He was a very good salesman. Yeah. Well, <laughs> did, did his little hanky trick and sucked into the hanky, and boy, there was all kinds of garbage. Oh, my God. <laughs> in my house, my mattress. Look at those human body scales he's showing me. Yeah. Exactly. Guess who used to do sell vacuum cleaners? <laughs> <laughs> and I bet you were very good, too. No, I think I sold with my mother if I recall. <laughs> no, I wasn't very good at all. But that's a whole other program. So you get it done tomorrow, Tiger. Okay. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. All right. Oh, that's why they have that. They write a rescission. But you shouldn't get confused. You don't have that. If you walk into a place of business and buy something, it has nothing whatever to do with anything. It only applies to sales away from the, the uh, vendor's premises and over 50 bucks. And it's three business days. you got to let them know in writing. And there are some very specifics. And uh, you have, they have to notify you this when you buy the thing, or otherwise they are in trouble. Well, I'm not saying in trouble, but their sale is in trouble. All righty, Portland, Oregon, you've been very patient. Hello there. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing real well, thank you. Okay, good. Um, I am interested in selling a sports novelty T-shirt. And what I mean by that is the shirt is uh, just a one-time thing. I'm not interested in getting into the T-shirt business per se. But No, it, no, you're going to get in the T-shirt business or you're not. Okay. Well, if it's a one-time thing, you're still in the t-shirt business. Okay. Why well, are you not? Uh, well, I hope so. Well, then you are. It's not, then you're interested in getting in the t-shirt business, maybe for a short tenure, but nonetheless. Okay. Go okay. ahead. And, and what, what the shirt deals with, uh, to be more specific, is the uh, current uh, a labor situation in one of the uh, major sports. Well, what are you talking about? The, what strike are you talking about? Baseball. Oh, that's a stupid strike, yeah. Yeah. I well, hope, also, I hope I, I'd like to see them settle that thing, but somewhere around uh, 2011. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so anyway, I, I had somebody make up some artwork uh, for the shirt. Mm -hmm. It turned out real well. Okay. I'm in the process of getting the artwork copyrighted through the government. Uh, what that process? It's a 10-second proposition. Well, you know, I called them. They they sent me all the paperwork, and so now I'm in the process of filling out the paperwork and giving them a twenty dollar check. I say twenty bucks, and it's over and done. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's no that's no big deal. So I, yeah, I just got all the paperwork today, mm -hmm. and so now what I'm doing is going down to the local screen uh, t-shirt printer and uh, having them make up uh, a couple dozen. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to know. Uh, uh, where would my best avenues be to distribute this T-shirt? Uh, but the, making them is easy. Mm -hmm. Selling them is a different matter. Right. You've got to reach people that want to buy T-shirts about baseball. Yeah. That, well, you say, yeah, but that's the answer to the thing. Now, probably your best shot for an amateur night is a sporting event of some kind. Yeah. At, at, so, at sporting events. Now, clearly, it's not going to be any baseball this time of the year, even, you know, amateur baseball unless you go into Puerto Rico or someplace you're not going to find much of that being played right now right now you might be able to do something on, on, on direct response television you con conceivably might do something in the, in, in the sports shops mm -hmm. uh, or advertising in sports magazines or sports channels like, like you know like ESPN that sort of thing but you mm -hmm. gotta have money to do that that's not an inexpensive process right what what about uh, going to a, a larger retail companies, uh, you know, the chains, of, and, and just uh, contacting their buyers? Well, that's not the easiest thing to do. You see, when you go to talk about chains, it's interesting. It's an interesting procedure. <clears throat> Having traveled this road personally, I didn't like it very much. I can tell you that. Uh, you've got to get on what's called the vendors list, mm -hmm. and that means you've got to show them before they will buy from you that you're financially able and. Uh, a solid citizen and been in business and all that kind of stuff before they'll buy from you. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Usually, the other, it's the other way around. You're trying to get them to prove that, they, that, that they're credit worthy before you ship stuff, right? Yeah. But it's just the other way around when you're talking about the big chains. Of course, if you make one sale from a big chain, your baby is born. Yeah. I mean, that's the other side of that. It's a, it's a, it's a tremendous deal if you can bring it off. Yeah. But it is an extremely difficult thing to do. You just, you just can't give them a call and send them a shirt and say, hey, take uh, a look at it? Not hardly. You can do that, yeah. But it's unlikely to get any attention unless it is absolutely catches somebody's eye and say, wow, what a great idea. Yeah. That's, that's been known to happen. Mm -hmm. But the lightning has been known to strike, too, in very unlikely places. Yeah. I wouldn't want to bet my, my ranch on that one. No. Right. No, the other thing is there's always the, the, other, the, the holidays are coming up. There's always the, the flea markets and that sort of thing. Yeah. But the problem, what's, what's the big problem with the flea markets? The, I, I've never been. Well, you never go to a flea market? 
No. Where have you been living all these years? <laughs> Oregon. <laughs> well, they have flea markets in Oregon. Yeah, I, no, I've just never gone to a flea no. market. Well, the thing is that people that go to these things are very price conscious. Mm -hmm. Whereas they want you to pay them 50 cents to take the t-shirt away. Mm -hmm. They are, they want to steal it. And you're not in a position to sell it that cheap. Right. Which is another, another problem. So it seems like my best route is just to go to these specialty stores, baseball card shops. Baseball both, that sort of thing where they make the independent judgment in the store. Absolutely. If you can sell them, I mean, God bless you. And you might find people that, that, that are interested in swimming. Let's face it. If you gave me one and give me a $50 bill, I wouldn't wear it. Because I just don't care. I think baseball is the greatest non-event that ever took place in the last maybe 30 years ago. But now these, these, these prima donnas that play baseball today, uh, they just have no interest in me. Yeah. There was a time. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but it certainly isn't, it isn't today. Yeah. So you couldn't sell one to me. So you're going to have to find people that uh, would enjoy this sort of thing. Yeah. And, where, and, and you're more apt to find them walking into a sporting goods store or it, or even mo more likely into a, uh, a card shop, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think your instincts are real good there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but but to go nationwide, I mean, I, you know, I'm just out here on the West Coast. Well, that's fine. If you have enough, I mean, going nationwide requires money. Unless you have a, an extraordinarily unusual novelty, the first thing or the second thing they want to know is how much you're going to spend on advertising. Good luck. I'm Bruce for TalkNet. 800-743-8000 is our number. 800-743-8000 with an open line or two. Orlando WDBO. Hunter, hello there. How you doing, Bruce? I'm just fine, thank you. Yes, I had a question about... Uh... I live in a subdivision with deed restrictions, uh, yeah. specifically regarding pickup trucks. Yeah, so do I. Well, I've got one. No, I live in a deed restricted community too. Is what I'm saying. I don't have a I don't have a pickup truck, thankfully. <laughs> but go ahead. Um, the subdivisions divided off into four different sections to where they were developed at different times. Mm -hmm. Section and, one, two, three, and four. Yes, sir. Yeah, I don't know how that works. Okay, um, section one, which was the first one, is exempt from all. Restriction. How can that be? Uh, it was written in by the developer. All right. Then there, then there are no, then there are just the deeds. It isn't, it isn't so much exempt as they weren't put in there. There's a difference. Right. Okay. Well, the that, that is also the entrance way to the subdivision. All right. All your dues that you pay to. Well, I, yeah, without regard to that. Uh huh. The individual, see, what it comes down to is the individual homeowner's deeds. If, if I understand what you're telling me, they do not contain. Restrictions. In the in the section in, one. In section one. Okay, right. that's just that's the way it is. Nothing to do about that. Okay, even uh, that's where the signs are saying that this neighborhood's governed by deed restrictions. Doesn't matter. Okay, um, in effect, that that they park pickup trucks in there, and the homeowner's stance is pickup trucks parked in the driveway brings down property value. I agree with that. Even if they're not work vehicles. I don't care what they are. Pick up truck trucks are trucks in the general public's eye. The difference in a work vehicle, from, uh, from an appearance point of view, might only be the, the sign on the side. Okay. Uh, how about like with? Uh, do you consider a Ford Bronco a truck? That's like a station wagon thing. Uh, no, it's a actually a truck. Does, does it have an open? Does it have a pickup bed, truck bed? It can if you take the top off from it. Well, that's that, that's a tough call. I would give you that. Okay. If the top uh, was on, I'd probably say no. The top off, I'd a, say yeah. Then what would a topper on a truck be considered? A camper cap? I'd say that's a truck. Just a topper truck, so it looks like a Bronco. That's a, that's a camper. That's still a truck. No, no, not a camper top. A, I know what you're talking about. A little cap. But uh huh. I don't think uh, that's a truck. By, by my here, you see, you see, maybe I have the wrong. I moved into a deed restricted community with great deliberation because I live in Florida, as you do. Mm hmm. And people come to the warmer climates. And they, I have a very close friend who stayed at my home last night, and he showed up in his camper. Mm -hmm. Now that's a motorhome. It's right. okay for one night in my driveway, and, and but I don't want the, I don't want my neighbors parking one of those things for two weeks where a guy comes to visit them, and right. I, I'm the first guy to pick up the phone and call the committee. Okay, so I don't. I think that pulls property value down. So do trucks. Even uh, so do boats. So do boats in the driveway. Boats in the yard. Boats. Okay. Um, how about if it's 
back back to the way that this restrictions written written up. Yeah, it, it, uh, is it in your deed, your specific deed? That's what it comes down to. But, in, no, no buts. Is it in your deed? Does it say you can't park trucks? It says you cannot have a truck on the lot. All right, then you which, can't. Which means you can't even have it in the garage. Well, that's good. So, you see, I don't. That you signed that. I don't. Just, I don't agree with that. If you if you can hide it in the garage, I think it shouldn't matter. But the way it's written, I understand that. Hide. I have. I have the same close friend of mine that has this 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 uh, you know this motorhome. Mm -hmm. In their area, he was telling about a guy that built an extra double wide garage so it could take this huge motorhome. All right. And they threw him out. Said you cannot keep a motorhome in. I remember going to a place in Palm Springs, California. I got the biggest kick out of it. When I mean, you drove into this restricted area, restricted, de-restricted area, mm -hmm. it said motorhomes, boats, and campers. Don't even think of it. <laughs> As you drove in, they, they, they laid it right on the line. It does. Now, there are a lot of people that want campers. There are a lot of people who want boats. I have a boat, but I have it in the water in the back of my house. I do not think that people should be allowed to park between the houses with boats and a trailer. I think that brings down the property value. Now, you may disagree with that. So you buy someplace where you can do it, and I buy someplace where you can't. Right. Uh, the pickup truck thing, though, even even if there's cars in the neighborhood that are worse off than no, the truck. But how do you, I understand that. How, does that. how does that not bring down property value? Well, how, how do you differentiate? Truck? What do you say now? You only park a, a car that's two years old in a neighborhood? That becomes very difficult. No, no. I'm talking about a car that's... Broke down, fenders are rusted off. And is it legally, is it licensed? Yes. Well, if it's licensed. You know, Florida doesn't have inspection. No, but they can also stop them on the road if they see it. And that never you, happens. And give you, that's not true. I, at least where I live, it's not true. They'll stop you. Okay. I, and, and with some justification, in my opinion. Fact is, but that's the way it is. I guess that's all I can tell you. You but, chose to go into a deed restricted. You can make the case that guys will spend $40,000 on a truck. And they do. I don't know why you would, but people do. But but nonetheless, if you have if if you have a restriction, I don't know how your part of the world is in your part of Florida. Mm -hmm. In my the county that I live in, the entire county, with the exception of one little downtown area, you can't park on the street anywhere in the county. Right. I think it's a great law. You drive into our area and you can look right down the street and never, not, not so much as one car on the street. Service trucks are out of park during the daytime. And people cut lawns and that kind of stuff. But now that's a county law, right? That's a key. But you think the people in the county didn't pass it? I think it's a great idea. And it, it well, yeah, that's one that could be changed also in our deed restrictions. That's true. Deed restrictions cannot be changed. Pardon? Not, they cannot be changed. Only if they're voted out. I was going to say, only if everybody, only, most states, I don't know about Florida, most states, everybody who has a similar restriction has to agree. One person can shoot it down. Hmm. And uh, also, if they don't, but now if they don't enforce it. That's another matter. But you see, anybody well, who, that, uh, any, listen to me, uh -huh. anybody in the area that has a similar deed restriction can move to the courts and to have the courts enforce it. But does it not matter if it, uh, like if the stipulation that it brings down property values and you can show that that's not true? Well, how can you show that? Uh, I've got access to uh, title information and I can pull the subdivision that's right next to mine. Not, it's not going to prove a thing. And they're, it's not going to prove anything. Honest to Pete. You're whistling in the dark. How, how does it not prove it, though? Because it doesn't. They could make the case that well, there's different variables over there. It just doesn't make. You're, you're whistling in the dark. I mean, what did you pay for your house? Uh, about a hundred. 100, well, 000. you're going to spend more than that in court if you're trying to beat something like this. Really? Oh yeah. My brother was the uh, uh, president of the Master Association, where he he lives in the similarly not where I live. But not that far away, okay? Mm -hmm. but, uh, I guess they're, I don't know which one has more. I guess his does. It doesn't really matter. But uh, they spent a great deal of their time. Just anybody who was violating the deed restriction, take them to court. And I don't think they ever lost. Is, is, now, if you're, if you're enforcing that, but you don't enforce it throughout the neighborhood, is that another can, question? Or No, it really isn't. I, they or, can or, enforce it on whoever they want to. They can, they can enforce it selectively because you have the option. You. Personally, mm -hmm. as an as a owner of property, you can enforce it. You don't need your association to do that. 
Yeah, uh, but why would you want to get everybody else in trouble? Oh, that's another matter. We That was what we said, wasn't it? But, I, I didn't say just as. Uh, a lot of people don't know this either. You can give a ticket just like a police officer. Did you know that? Yes, I did. Well, a lot of people didn't know that. I have done it. I gave a guy a ticket. But most people don't realize that. You can be the complaining officer. And you go to court, you testify against them. Now you say, well, I don't want to make enemies. That's a whole different program. But you have the right. I didn't say the responsibility. I didn't say you want, but you have the right. That is your remedy. So it's it's, it's not like a regular law that has to be enforced on everybody. You no, sir. Can't, you can just pick somebody out and yeah. more or less be prejudiced against one person. Absolutely. Okay. But you can go, but, but you have the right to enforce it against all others. And then that would be probably the only way to change it. Well, no, because there only takes one guy, as I remember the law. Now, it may be different from state to state. It may be that a majority, but I don't believe so. Most places, if there are, let's say, 100 people that all have the same deed restriction, let's say you can't put up a peripheral fence for the sake of discussion, all 100 would have to agree to have it changed. And getting 100 people to agree the sun comes up in the east is a very difficult problem. I do wish you well, my friend. I know how you feel, and a lot of people feel as you do. And I, I think it's probably good. But the thing is that if you want to live in a, in, a, in a more conforming community, and I do only because I feel that a lot of folks will move in as they have tried to do in adjacent communities, and the next first thing it's a boat in the yard, the next thing it's a camper, the next thing it looks like tobacco road. Well, the alternative is to have uh, self-imposed restriction. I see I prefer that to law. Because I elected, I elected to, to move in, I didn't have to. And I'm confident I could find a community that had no restrictions, as can you. But that's your choice as I view it. I'm Bruce Williams. Good luck, kid. This is Talk Net. Be done. I don't care how good you are. You can't do it. You've got to start mechanizing. I think we can agree on that. And there are other variables. to, And the idea of, of your payables and your receivables not getting done simply because of volume is inexcusable. You got to hire someone. That's their function. That's their job. Someone that can do it themselves. But that's all. Yeah, have the authority. Well, that's there. There you go. That's that's. Well, you see, I, I do a. Well, I'm going to do one of these. I was trying to think of the name of the place. It's a Tescadero. There's a great a Tescadero, California. Paso Robles, where I'll be on Thursday evening, and that's probably one of the things we'll get into when we we start, you know, chatting. Uh, the ability to delegate is a requisite to success. I have never, ever met anybody who was successful, moderately successful, who couldn't delegate. Hmm. Have you? Well, certainly not within what I'm trying to work with. Well, no, I'm talking about your whole life. No. Have you ever met anybody who's enjoyed a decent amount of success that couldn't delegate? I have yet to meet one. Maybe I'm sure he's out there. She's out there somewhere, but I've never met them. No, I haven't either. You've got to learn, and that's maybe the, the lesson that you have to hammer home to these folks, that they are only human, that they can only have, tw their day comes on a clock with 24 hours, just like the rest of us. And after a while, you simply cannot do all the things that are required in the business. With these two, I need a literal hammer. But I was hoping you had some magic well, thing. Well, no, nothing going. magic about it. You say, look, you're going to change your ways or you're going to perish. Now, there, as my eldest son continually points out, there are two kinds of people, two only. One of them, if you tell them the stove is hot, they say thank you and they avoid the stove. Then there's the other class, which may be your friends, they got to smell burning flesh. Well, there's too much of the, too much burning flesh, there's nothing to go around, you see what I'm saying? Some people have to learn the hard way. You hope they can afford the tuition. I do wish you well. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Savannah, Georgia, hello there. Hi, Bruce. How are you? I am just fine, thank you. Uh, Bruce, um, I have a question for you. 22 years we've been married, and in the 22 years we are, uh, as far as credit cards and things, we are like 22000 in debt. thousand bucks a year, huh? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I figured it. <laughs> anyway, uh, we figure we're going to keep on paying because of the interest. Right and everything. So we thought of getting an equity line of credit, uh, which is a lower interest rate, and we're wondering if this would be the right way to go. Well, here's the. What is your first name? Lorraine. Lorraine. It very likely may be one step. 
but only one. Okay. Because the, the fact is that you're married 22 years, which means you're at least 30. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's it's, it's kind of grow up time. Right. Uh, you just can't keep, keep get, you just can't stay in hot like this. At the current interest rate you're paying, uh, you're probably paying something like uh, four thousand dollars a year in interest. Mm. Well, you're never going to get even at that, that rate. Well, I already uh, did something about that by cutting all the cards up. <laughs> well, you see, that's all right, but that's sort of like soaking the matches so you don't burn your fingers. I think it's it also requires a certain amount of discipline, mm -hmm. and that means. Because you can always call, as long as you're in good standing, you can do the card. Right. So, well, let's, let's, uh, uh, now the next thing is, what is the, the, the nature, of, very briefly, I don't want to know, I don't write uh -huh. uh -huh. Most of this stuff, what is it, just day-to-day -day expenses or well, it's some clothing? Of, or? Uh, some of it was clothing, some of it came from uh, medical bills when the girl, you know, the girls would get sick and that kind of thing. And, mm -hmm. Uh, and things would get tight because they would get sick and they also had a lot of uh, special needs uh, like speech therapy and things like that so mm -hmm. that took a big chunk of money there. Well you and see the problem with that Lorraine is that these are all temporary things you get if you get a home equity line uh -huh. which I, I said I don't necessarily object to uh -huh. you're paying for years and years for things that should have been paid for at the time. Uh -huh. Maybe one thing if you said look I put a roof on my house that's a long-term payout Right. But the other things are, are, are should be uh, your current budget, but we're not. Now, right. Okay, so, okay, we're going to do that. We're going to go out and get a home equity line. And there's, there's two things that are operative here. The first is that the re interest rate should be significantly less than you're currently paying. It is. And the second is that the interest is now tax deductible. Right. Which it is not presently. Those are the pluses, right? Right. The minuses are you're hawking your house to pay for groceries and kids' dresses and that kind of stuff. <laughs> And that is not a good notion. Right. Now, and furthermore, most equity lines of credit are at a minimum of five years. Uh-huh. That doesn't mean you have to take five years to pay them off. Now, how old are your rugrats at this point? Okay, I have a 20-year-old and a 13-year-old. Well, a 20-year-old is an adult. A right. A 13-year-old is certainly old <laughs> enough. still at to, home. <laughs> oh, they're still legally it's an adult. Right. <laughs> are, you, are you employed? Part-time. No, well, what, what's wrong with going to work full-time? Well, uh... Oh, no. <laughs> well, there's a lot of reasons. Well, give me one good one. Okay. Uh, I really like what I'm doing right now. That's not a good one. Okay. Uh, you're 22,000 bucks in hot, honey. That's not well, a good I, reason. Well, I thought about doing that, about getting a full-time job. What do you earn part-time? Uh, well, uh, about $400 a month. Yeah, and I only go in... That's, that's, no, that's, that's a hobby. Right. <laughs> That's a hobby. Well, you're laughing. I'm going to get well, it's a good Now I'm going to start picking on you. I know. It's a good hobby, though. What do you do? Uh, I, uh, well, I teach adult. I coordinate the literacy program for our, for our area. That's a hobby. Okay. <laughs> now, are you a teacher by profession? No. What is your background? My background is more clerical. Well, if you were not got a job for fifteen, seventeen, five a year, uh -huh. you'd clear this up in a year and a half. Uh -huh. Now, that would be the adult, intelligent thing to do. I didn't say it was the thing that you want to do. Uh -huh. You're going to give up something you enjoy doing, all that kind of good stuff. Right. But unfortunately, you guys dug a hole. Now, I didn't, I'm didn't. i not saying that I wouldn't have been right in there with a shovel with you. Uh -huh. But the fact is, how much money do you have in the bank right now? Uh, cash money. Cash money? Yeah. Lord at mercy, just a few hundred. Yeah, well, I, that's, you're, walk, you're walking the bear edge and nothing. Uh -huh. How much does your husband earn? <laughs> About 65000 yeah. a year. Well, you guys are living beyond your means, clearly. Uh huh. And we could talk about that another time. Right. But what I think that you should be doing is giving up the hobby. Right. And getting a real job. And getting a real and job. And every single solitary Kopec. Rash Bucknick uh -huh. goes to reduce that debt. Uh -huh. Right. Well, that's, and I, and I mean that very sincerely. And then the next six months or a year, every single penny goes into some saving plan that will allow you to get at it in case of another emergency coming down the pike. Uh huh. Now, that's, that's, not, what we're, that's what we want to work for. Well, but that know? means that unless you change something dramatically in your life. Uh huh. You're not going to be able to do that. Okay. And it means you getting back on the payroll. And, you know, you can't say, well, they need me at home right now. You got Your kids are old enough to do without you in a date. They aren't there in a daytime anyway. Right. Well, that's true. All right. 
So there's no excuse for you to stay home in terms of the family. It would be nice if you could. Don't misunderstand me. Mm -hmm. But right now you can't. That's true. Well, um, I was just wondering, you know, because we do, you know, also thinking of commuting where I have to go. It's it's a, it's a good way to get anything that's going to pay. So you're going to think of also um, the the gas and the upkeep of the car and all that you kind know, of stuff. These are all canards. Mm -hmm. These are all excuses. Okay. Excuses. <laughs> well. You? Yeah, you're doing your best to make those excuses because you don't want to do what I said. Well, no, no, it's not an excuse. I want, uh, I just really, I mean, that's something that I think about is that, I mean, is it going to be that worthwhile? Well, let me ask you this. Right now, what you're doing, is that worthwhile? Do you, does that help very much? The answer is clearly no. No, 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 of course not. All right, not. so you got to jump that idea. Uh-huh. And get into something that I don't believe you're going to have to go to. Where do you live now? I live, uh, well, I live outside Savannah. I live in the, in the, in the Guyton how, area. How far are you from Savannah? About 25, 30 miles. Well, I think you could find a bus that goes into Savannah, I'll bet you. No, nah, we don't have well, buses out no here. No buses? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll bet you could find a carpool. I don't know. That's really hard, too. A lot of people, it's, oh. it's hard. No, well, I, I know that by experience because of, uh, of the people that uh, go in there, it's really hard to do that. Sweetheart, there are nine to fivers just like you. Well, that's true, but uh, but nothing. Well, that, there's. I thought of that that there could be the chance of finding some, you know, uh, after you, you know, where you get a job, to find out where you're at. Many, many employers today work carpools out. Uh -huh. Many cities have special lanes just for carpools. They have areas where you can dri drive your car and pick up people, and so don't, it can be done. This uh -huh. is the real. I'm trying to get you kicking and screaming into the real world. Right. And you get, and I know what you're doing. I, if you think I haven't done exactly what you're doing, <laughs> you're thinking of every damn reason why you don't can't do what you know you have to do. Well, I that's true. I, I can hear your 13 year old mom. I can't do my algebra tonight. <laughs> and I can hear all all my hey, it's a long walk to school tomorrow. I mean, they're expecting four foot of snow here in Savannah. I can hear it now. <laughs> oh my, you heard? Remember the floods last year? Well, they might come. You know, all those are excuses to get out of what you know has to be done. Now, you are a full-grown, 100% adult. Let's go out and prove it. I do wish you well, out here. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. We go now to Seattle, Washington to see what's cooking. Hello there. How are you doing, Bruce? I couldn't be better, thank you. Glad to hear it. Thanks for taking my call. I have a, what I hope is a pretty straightforward question for you. Well, I hope I got a straightforward answer for you. Okay. Is there ever a time when purchasing property, when having a survey certified to yourself is not required? Required? Yeah, you pay cash. No. I, what I'm, you what said I'm, required. Well. Or nearly a, a, a lender will, will absolutely require a survey. Right, but I think I've heard you speak in the past about having a survey done that you pay for that's yeah. certified to yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I would not be comfortable. Now, I've never bought major pieces of property. I think the biggest piece I ever bought was 30 acres, something like that. Mm -hmm. So you go out and buy you know, thousands of acres, then it's plus or minus 100 acres, and those kind of deals, when they give you general descriptions, maybe that's okay. But on a smaller piece of property where, where a property line can be very critical... You, know, you buy 20,000 acres, I don't really think it matters very much usually if, if it, the line wanders hither or a little bit of thither, maybe even a yon. But on a small deal, it can be critical to the, to the transaction. What prompts the question? We're, uh, we're in the process of negotiating for what they call five perfect acres, which is a piece 330 feet by 660 feet. If, you were gonna buy, if I was buying five acres, I would get it uh, surveyed. Okay, our, um, our attorney and our realtor have told us that because of the way it's platted, okay. it's yeah. already been surveyed and they have numbers on it, and our earnest money agreement states that the seller is obligated to provide us with the property corners. There's sure, six-foot sure. rebar in the fine, ground. Fine, fine, fine. Listen, that's what they, I, you're telling me, would I buy it? Ask me the question, would I buy it? Mm -hmm. and the answer is absolutely no. No. What's a survey? A thousand bucks for this, maybe? Thirty five hundred to five thousand. That sounds awfully high to me. Well, it did to me too, and given that that's a 
uh, you know, I think all, to, all these all these monuments are in play. Who told you the thirty five hundred to five thousand? Surveyor. You went to an engineering company? Yeah, a couple of them called them on the phone. That sounds very high to me. I don't see why it would cost that much if it's as, as easy as you're telling me. It's a, a perfect square. All you do is shoot a couple of lines and the monuments are in place and so forth. Why well, would it be so much? It's raw land. It's all woods. It's not regard to that. Okay. Why is it so much? I don't know, but that seems to be the going rate. What, out are, you, here. what are you paying for the property? Uh, we're hoping to pay about sixty-five. Yeah. See, so five thousand dollars seems well, significant. Well, you, you said that's the high number. You're asking me. I would not buy a piece of property without a survey. I don't see why it costs that much. Okay. I don't see what there is unless you unless you're. Are you going to finance this? You're paying cash. Uh, some of must both. be seller financed, right? Uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's going to be like a two year deed of trust, but we'll cash it out before then. Well, I'm trying to get to is that the bank would never give it to you under those. What do you got? What do you you want to build something on this property? Yeah, we're going to build. Well, what are you, how are you going to build with our survey? Tell me. Well, as I understand, the piece of property is platted. Why don't you get down to the bank and see if they will loan? How much is the house going to, you're going to spend for it? You're going to buy it? Uh, the total package or? No. How much if you went out of the bank and you want to borrow the money for a house? How much? Oh, I think when the whole thing's over, we'll probably be borrowing a right around 150 Get out of the bank and see if they'll loan you the 150 Well, they seem fine with it, provided we do a feasibility study. I was talking about that. Okay. I'm, I didn't say that you you aren't, you aren't credit worthy. No, I mean, well, the bank has seemed fine with it without a survey. Well, in that case, be my guest. I would not. Okay. Right, first, I have two things that are operative here. The first, and I'm well, there's a surveyor out there. I'd love to hear from him. Or maybe an attorney who wants to comment at the number 703-413-8381. 703-413-8381. I want to know a number of things. I want to know, will a title company accept this documentation that you have and guarantee that the title and the, and the appropriate lines are there and there are no incursions and no encroachments? That's the first thing I want to know. None of those things. Secondly, I want to know, will a lender ordinarily loan you money without the property even when you're gonna the property would be your down payment essentially but i want to know would they go on the hook for uh, a mortgage without knowing that the property had been appropriately surveyed and certified and i'm sure that's that, that, that some lenders will yeah what we're doing is called an all-in-one construction loan so what, what, what they'll do is they will uh give us money in, in hand us money in, in pieces, if you I, will, it, as it's done, it, and then we'll so roll I, I have no problem with that. But right. you see, what happens for the sake of this discourse, if after this is all done, the house is the, the greatest house in the world built just like you want, right? Mm -hmm. And we find that we have, a, we have a real serious defect over here. In terms of a title problem? Yeah. Well, there's or, or for the sake of discussion, that the line isn't where you thought it was, and you built the house, which is, a guy called me, by the way, that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. The line wasn't where he thought that his house is on somebody else's property. What now? There was a whole, in one case, it was a whole development. Dozens of homes built on the wrong property. They, somebody misread it. Mm. Tell me what you do. I don't know. I, I, not me. You see, my, I work too hard for my money to have that happen. To me, it's just another cost of doing business. That's all. But I am prepared to listen to somebody who knows a lot more than I. Number 703. I want you to hang on a minute because maybe they'll ask you some questions that I have not, I've been appropriately questioning you. 703 413 8381. 703 413 8381. If you're a lender, how do you feel about this? If you're an attorney, your opinion is solicited. If you're a surveyor, why five grand to have a relatively simple survey completed? I'd like to know. Number 703 413 83. Eight one. Hopefully, we'll have some contributors. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talk Net. Alrighty, I was chatting with a gentleman in Seattle, Washington. I have a. He wanted to. He is buying a piece of property, and he said, "Should I get it surveyed?" I said, "Yes. It's going to cost a lot of money." Englewood, Florida, is a surveyor or an engineering firm that does surveying. Hello there. Hi. Hello. How are you? I'm fine. Why would it cost five grand for a relatively simple survey? Five. Well, I. I, I couldn't imagine that it would for five acres, but it depends a lot on the control. If um, if the subdivided, you know, if it's already been subdivided and platted, it shouldn't certainly shouldn't cost that much. Uh, but some of his options, he could have, he could talk to. If he's already talked to three surveyors and they've all given him the exact same amount uh, dollar wise, then um, there's a problem in that subdivision. Um, not meaning that there's a problem with the subdivision, but there's a problem with the control. 
What do you mean when you say the control? You mean the monument that you go back to for reference point? Right. In other words, the surveyor has to tie in. Most states require that they tie into two points to uh, make sure that they, you know, they've got... Are you there, dear? Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. And, uh, uh, but some of the options he has is he, is he could, uh, if there's a survey that's been done already, he could ask uh, that same surveyor to do an update survey. Now that thought occurred to me as well. And that, that would save him some money and uh, then ask him to flag the corners because like you said, um, and it happens here all the time, um, people build on the wrong lot. <laughs> uh, or they think they're buying one lot. And when the surveyor goes out and, you know, and we go stake it, they come back to us and say, we surveyed the wrong lot. That's not my lot. That's my lot. Yeah, that, oh, I bought the lot next door. Well, right. no, you didn't. This is the lot that, of the legal description you gave me. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing um, he could check, he should check out is when he applies for a building permit, he needs to check with his building department because they'll require a survey. Um, oh, that's an interesting point. I hadn't thought of that. Then they yeah. usually do. In... In Englewood here, um, it's only good for six months in our county. So when a survey is done, it's only good for six months. And then what happens is our people will come back, say, a year and a half from now and ask for an update survey. Mm -hmm. And that's a relatively modest cost. Um, in most cases, it is, provided that we did the original survey. Yes, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah, that's why if he has a survey done um, or, or the previous owner did, he needs to go back to that same company. But you raise a very valid point. If you want, he wants to build a home, and in most jurisdictions, you gotta you gotta lay a survey on the on the building department before they'll give you a building permit. Correct. And it has to so you position the place to be certain that it meets the side, rear, and uh, front yard requirements. Right, and the you know if he's on a septic system or central sewer, he needs to know the uh, uh, requirements for septic mm -hmm. um, or, or the proximity and all that kind of good stuff. Correct. Indeed. All right. Thank you. I thank you so very, very much. Well, thank you, and I enjoy listening. Thank you, ma'am. Before right, we go to Greenville, South Carolina, we got a realtor on the on the horn. Hello there. Good evening, Bruce. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing real well. Well, I've been practicing real estate for a couple years here in Greenville, and I have yet to run across a banker who will write a mortgage without a survey. Me neither. And if I was sitting on the board, or if I had stock in the bank... Right. I would be very upset if they were loaning money on real estate that was not appropriately platted and surveyed and certified. Especially when you're talking about five acres and it's out in the woods somewhere and who knows what property lines have been doing for the past couple hundred years. There could be a stream involved. We just, you know, a banker would be nuts to, hey, sign me up with that bank if, it's, if it's yeah, I'm thinking Yeah, I'm thinking the same thing. Maybe they, maybe they loan me some money and some other stuff that I own. Yeah, I've been trying to buy the Brooklyn Bridge now for about 10 years. Listen, I've got it for sale. Don't worry about a thing. We'll talk <laughs> later. Thank you very much, Guy. I appreciate it. Okay, Bruce. Seattle, are you still there? Yes, I am. Give you something to think about? Yeah, I appreciate it. That the, 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 the point the lady made is is you want to check with the building department. Mm -hmm. It's entirely possible, hoping it becomes moot, that they will, in most places that I have had occasion to build or even major alterations or additions. Not alterations, but additions. It was just enough to... Uh, run a few lights, run a fridge, run the freezer. Go ahead. But what happened was the contractor installed a drain pipe into our electrical main, into our home. Say again, he put a drain pipe into your main few, main source of power? Yes. And there's water going in there? Yep. It filled up with water. It took, you know, what, three months to create a problem. But what he had done was drilled right into the main uh, conduit and put... Uh, the drain right into it. He what, he it. thought that was a waste pipe or something? Yeah, he thought I mean, it was. He, he deliberately connected this thing to your to your electrical conduit? Yes. Boy, where'd they find this guy? Well, he's an older gentleman learning a new trade, and he uh, he's having a hard time, I think. Boy, it would appear so. Yeah. Anyway, uh, my concern is I'm trying to just settle this with these guys without turning it in on my homeowner's. Or going after well, there's you. no reason to turn it on you. First of all, I don't think it would be covered by your homeowners. Okay. Because the homeowners, in terms of water, only covers sudden, and three months is hardly sudden. Right. By anybody's standard. Right. Now, if this guy did what he did, my re personal reaction would be to say, we got an emergency situation here, hire somebody to do it, then go after him for the money. Okay. Yeah, we went ahead and hired an electrician to fix it. Right. 
and these, this contractor has agreed to pay for all of that and all the damages uh, mm. uh, skirting around our house. All right, so what is he then? then so it sounds to me like you're okay. What are you looking for? Well, he's not willing to sign anything in agreement that I want him to do, uh, you know, fix the skirting. Uh, well, you said, wait a minute. A minute ago, you said he's willing to do all these things. Right. Well, we'll let him go do them. What do you care about signed agreements? Now, should I expect any uh, compensation? compensation? No. Okay. I think you ought to get paid for the valve you replaced. Right. And whatever it takes to get the... the no, I don't think you've even damaged in that fashion. Okay, so we, we, we couldn't spend... Well, the, the electrician couldn't fix the electricity until the following Monday. And see, this was on a Saturday, and we had to find a place to stay. Would you go to a hotel? No, we stayed with relatives. Well, that case, you didn't expend any monies then. If you stayed at a hotel, I'd say be responsible, but you didn't, okay. so... So just be happy with having him... Well, it's not a question to be happy. I'm not asking. You to be, right. I'm not asking you to be happy and go around Shortland, but I'm saying that's that's where your damages, I think, end. Okay. And happily so. Right. Could well, be a lot yeah. worse. Right. Right. But boy, I never that. I'll tell you, that's a first for me. Yeah. I Drilling into electrical. Say, oh, what a nice little drain this is. Hello. He's lucky to be alive, I believe. I was about to point that out to yeah. you. Good luck, my friend. Okay, thank you, Bruce. I'm Bruce Williams. Ah. Stick around for more. This is TalkNet. We go now to Ithaca, New York. Hello there. Hi, Bruce. Hello. How are you doing? I'm doing real well. What's on your mind, guy? Well, I'm uh, right, currently I'm a deputy sheriff, and I'm trying to start a small business. Uh, it's in lawn mowing and lawn care and that kind of thing. Hmm, you arrest reckless one lawnmower drivers or something. <laughs> well... I haven't so far. I know one of the other deputies had. <laughs> you kidding me? No, I'm not kidding you. <laughs> Reckless lawnmower? Well, apparently this uh, gentleman had a few DWIs in the past, and uh, he was known to drive his lawnmower down to the local bar. So. Uh, oh, what? Oh. You know, Guys like that on the road and etc. So you ought to be busted. Yeah, I have no car. I have no no sympathy for people who drink and drive anything, including a bicycle. Yeah. Well. He was arrested, so okay. he's off the road now. <laughs> okay, Sheriff, so what's on your mind? Okay, well, I was thinking about uh, starting a small uh, business of my own on the side. Uh, right, first of all, are you permitted, you know, in some, some professions, uh -huh. you're not permitted to do that. Are you permitted as a sheriff to yes. do that? Yes. Okay. Yeah, as long as uh, I don't put in more than 20 hours a week. But there are restrictions on you, then. Yeah, they they want us to be as fresh as possible. Well, yeah, you're walking around carrying guns, aren't you? Oh, definitely. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'd want you fresh, too. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, anyway, my my problem is I've uh, gone ahead and I've uh, lined up all the equipment I think I'm going to need. Uh, I've got a trailer and a lawnmower and all, you know, string trimmer and hedge trimmers and everything else. Yep. Uh, but it's taken me quite a while this summer to get going on this project. I'm just wondering uh, uh, if it might be a little too late to start this. Well, year. unfortunately, the it's never too late as long as there is a service needed to be performed. Uh -huh. There was a, maybe some guy out there who's never had a service before. Now, clearly, uh, most lawn contracting is done months and months in advance. I mean, I make my deal with the guy who does my lawns. Well, he's been doing it for so many years, just kind of a, it, it perpetuates itself. But nonetheless, we kind of nod at each other around january 1 for uh -huh. the next for the next year but there's nothing to prevent you from going out there and soliciting some business now mm -hmm. particularly if you see somebody whose lawn looks a little unkept even though as you point out it's not the the super growing season right up to october november in in the uh in your part of the world that shouldn't uh -huh. be a big problem and yeah. what do you have to lose by soli you have to go out and start soliciting now yeah okay and even even for next year so you you think uh, well? My next question was about uh, advertising and lining up. Uh, well, I think that you're going to do most of that initially, person to person, one on one. Oh, okay. You can so, certainly run some advertising. I would hope that you'd consider radio as well as the news uh, news uh, media. Yeah, I was thinking but, about that. But but the point is that at the beginning, one on one is where you're going to have to go. Now the the the, the, the media. Guys like us can generate leads for you, and you certainly don't want to ignore that. Uh -huh. But you also don't want to ignore just riding down the street. You see a place isn't kept up well, knock on the door and say, guess what we could do for you? Uh-huh. Oh, okay. It's a combination of the two, as I see it. Yeah, okay. Well, it's, have... it's a lot of tough work at the beginning. 
Yeah, well, uh, my uh, brother-in-law was doing it up to about three years ago when he became disabled. Uh, how, how did he do? Oh, uh, he was. He said he was doing real well, and I don't have any reason not to believe him. I mean, he had top-of-the-line equipment, and you know, bought himself a new uh, truck to tow his brand new trailer and brand okay, new. Okay, so you apparently trailer. he was doing okay. Yeah. You might want to. But he hasn't wanna... been too much help in uh, giving me leads. Uh, well, three-year-old think... leads not worth very much. Well, I think I don't think he ever really got out of it. I think he hired someone else to. Well, I'm mad. That's over. his privilege. But yeah. you might you might ask him how he developed his initial business. Well, that's what I did, and he wasn't very helpful. Was well, like in that very case, protective of his business or something. Well, I don't blame him for that. You're going to competition with him. Be yeah, still in business. <laughs> Good luck, guy. Okay. Well, thanks an awful lot. It's been a pleasure. I'm Bruce Williams for Talk Man. <laughs> We go now to Renton, Washington. How you doing? Real good. How are you doing, Bruce? Super. What's up? Um, I just want to let you know my husband introduced me to you nine months ago when we got married and I haven't stopped listening since. It's been great. Well, I congratulate him on his choice of ladies as well as talk show hosts. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, this is my question. We live in a two-year-old housing tract. We had got brand new neighbors in a brand new house next door three weeks ago, and we came home to find that they chopped down a tree. That tree was in between our property lines. They owned in between or on? It's pretty hard to be in between. Well, on the property line. Mm -hmm. They owned 60% of the tree, and we owned 40. They had no business chopping that down. I wanted to keep my 40. <laughs> right. Um, the tree is gone. Mm -hmm. We've also lost three sections of our fence over this now. Um, How is that? How did that get to you? Tell me about that. <laughs> um, this guy decided he wanted to have the stump pulled also. And when they were pulling the stump, they also pulled three sections of our fence down. Is he prepared to replace those? So what he has done is use the old, well, he attempted to use the old damaged pieces and was using those and I went out there and said, excuse me, this isn't gonna fly. Um, it, it just, no, this is unacceptable. So he feels as though he doesn't have to contribute any money or anything to what is this fiasco that he has incurred upon us. Well, he does if he wanted to have, but the question is you gotta live next door to this jerk. Right, and um, I personally don't care. I really don't have to look at him that often. I don't care how. I'm angry. <laughs> well, I, know, I would never have guessed that from your tone. No, <laughs> of course not. <laughs> but um, I, I don't, I just want to know, I mean, what are my options from here? Um, yes, I could go through the insurance company and have our fence paid for and rebuild. Or, How? Wait a minute. How, on, on what basis can you go through the insurance company? Um our, our fence got down. I don't know. I assumed our fence got damaged. It was our neighbor who did it. That may be, but that doesn't mean that you get, you're insured against that. I don't think you are. Oh. I don't know you're, what my options are then. <laughs> well, that's one I don't think you have. Okay. Your option is to, eat, to go to this guy and say, look, you busted up our fence. I want it replaced just as it was before you busted it up. Uh-huh. That's one option. You secondly, you say, how big a tree we got here? Um, it was about 150 or 200 foot fir tree. You're kidding me. It was beautiful. <laughs> oh, and let me tell you this too. It shaded our home. We have direct like southern exposure. When it's 80 degrees outside, it's about 90 on the inside. And it's just gotten worse. <laughs> Why did this guy do this? Um, is it possible to say he's a butt? <laughs> he's a what? He's a butt. <laughs> yeah, horses, you know what? Yeah. Um, well, why did he do it still? I what was he thinking he, about? I think that he is, um, he's young. Um, well, I'm only 27. He's probably uh, early 30s. And, and I think he's just mentally very, he doesn't understand what an asset to his house. He paid a $6,500 premium just for the privilege of having these beautiful trees. That was huh. just one of them. He chopped them all down. Why? I, furthermore, is he, furthermore, do you have a in, in your community? Do you, in many communities, you can't chop trees down above a certain size without getting a permit. Right, I tried that. I even got the little city commissioner to. Call and is him. there a, is there such a law? No, there's not. All right, I tried. Well, <laughs> Save the point is that, that I've only got a few seconds. Sure. Point is that you 
if the tree, would, I can see why I took the stump out too, because that's evidence. Do you have pictures, I hope? Yes, we do. All right, the fact is that that tree was 40% of your property. You've been damaged. Yes. He had no right to remove that. Now, I know trees are no respect to property lines. You can take out his 60, but he can't damage your 40, which in, in point in fact becomes a, uh, an impossible situation. Okay. But without some type of other authority, either from permission from you or having a court intercede on his behalf, he has damaged you. Okay. Now, if he's going to be continue to be a horse's patoot, you might want to sue this guy. Okay. First thing you have to do is figure out what a tree like that's worth. Now, obviously, it can't be replaced. Mm-hmm. Even if you want it to, you can't buy a 150-foot tree. They don't make them that big to, right. to pick up and move. But you want to get an estimate from a landscaper or someone similar. <laughs> I'm serious. No, I understand. Because when the so same fun. guy, you're probably going to hire to put a tree on your side of the property line to replace the one that's gone. So at least to get it started growing and getting your shade back. Uh-huh. Because you could put in a 12, 15-foot tree right away. Right. Uh, and get an estimate of what it's worth. And also what your fence is worth. And then bingo, here we go. Off and running the small claims court. Okay. I mean, this guy is going to be a lousy neighbor. Maybe they may, may as well straighten his... Yes, sir. <laughs> I almost said it right away. <laughs> I do wish you well, my dear. Thank you very much. It's been good talking to you. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talk Man. Littleton, North Carolina. Hello there. Hello, Mr. Williams. Need your advice or uh, thoughts on a uh, problem with the septic field. Uh-oh. Got a new house, a new septic field, and you the, uh, the, get the affluent just coming up out of the ground. Yeah. I, got a, I got a panel well, system. What, you got a what? Panel system versus uh, the regular pipe that they use. What do you mean? Well, I'm not sure what a panel system is. Uh, they, sometimes a brand name would be like a T&J. No, don't give me a brand oh. name. Just tell me how it works. Uh, it, it's a cinder block surrounded by sand with uh, with pipe down the center of it, basically. Um, it's supposed well, it sounds to be... like a dry well to me. Well... <laughs> no, no, don't laugh. Yeah. That's, like, that's uh, what you've described is a, is a dry well, where the you have a septic tank that handles the um, solid material, yeah. and then the water flow, the water flow, the, the solid material goes to the bottom where it's supposedly... Active, uh, acted upon by bacteria, the water then flows either into a leaching field or into what are called dry wells. Now, it sounds to me like that's what we're talking about. Ah, uh, well, I got a septic tank that flows into another tank, and I pump it up a hill to the back side of the house. All right, the other tank is the dry well. Okay. Are you allowed to do that? Yeah. yeah pump it up? It's all, yeah, it's all approved by the county, supposedly. Okay, so you're just pumping the water. Right. Up over the hill, and where's it go from there? Well, it's coming up out of the ground. And, uh, across the yard and the driveway. Well, what's it supposed to do over the hill? <laughs> what? No, no, you're laughing. I'm yeah. serious. What's supposed to happen to it? Is it going into a leaching field, into oh, tanks, or what? It, it pumps it up into a hill, into a leaching field that All uses right. a panel system. Well, what is a panel system? Well, instead of the normal pipe and gravel they put down, this is a, it's a different kind of uh, system. It's a, Well, I understand it's different, but I, could you give me a, a little more descriptive? Tell me how it's constructed. Uh, it's basically like a porous cinder block with a pipe running through it with, you know, holes in the bottom of it. And right. They fill it, uh, pack it around sand. And so the, 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 the uh, block, the block becomes the distributing method. Correct. And it's supposed to percolate out through the sand into the ground and also out into the air in the form of evaporation. Mm -hmm. Correct. And they use a panel system. When you have a smaller lot and it's questionable on the perking of the lot. Uh -huh. So that you only use 200 feet of this panel system where you would normally use 400 feet of a regular system. I it's see. It's supposed to be the equivalent. But it's not working. But it's not working from day one. New house, new lot. Mm -hmm. So we've been going on for seven, eight months like this. And we've been researching it, talking with the health department. We've had the state out here mm -hmm. and all sorts of things. And we found out that our lot was designed for a house that was smaller than ours um, than what we designed for. Um, well, who went? You bought a piece of property and then built your own home? Correct. Well, you we know, you, you were shooting your toes off all of you. <laughs> you no, know, you've, already, you've already done so many things that I think are, are very perilous. Okay. You don't call a state, you don't call a county, you don't call a town. 
Because if push comes to shove, they can close you down, throw you out of your house. Oh, I know that. And you made the mistake. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, and you were the builder. Well, uh, yeah, we, we bought the lot from the developer. But who did the... You bought the lot separately. Is that correct? Correct. And then we you, bought... Hold it. You owned the lot, and then you had a house built. Correct. Yeah, no, it don't, now, don't say correct if that's not absolutely accurate in every detail. That's accurate. Well, then you're the builder. Oh, pardon me? You are the builder, then. Well, I had a, sub, a, a contractor, no, yeah. that may be, but you're the builder, so okay. the responsibility is yours. All right. So why in the world would you start alerting the authorities that you're in violation? Well, <laughs> I, I, I didn't, more or less. Uh, the contractor got uh, the septic people in on it. They got the state, uh, the county in on it. Why did they get the state and county in? Uh, because we had problems. They were we were trying to resolve it. I, well, you, you can't, oh, boy. <laughs> you don't resolve things by calling regulators in. Yeah. The septic people were afraid you were going to sue them, weren't they? Uh, I don't, I don't know where we stand on that. Well, I don't know where you stand either. I mean, I can see where you could get kicked out of your own house. Well, I, I know that. Um, I, no, can't, is there, how big a yard you got up top of this hill? Well. How big? Uh, size-wise? I, yeah, size-wise. Well, the whole house, the whole lot and everything else is six-tenths of an acre. All right, that's a little over half an acre, but that's the house situated, you have a well? Uh, no, it's a central well site for the subdivision. All right, then. Uh, the With that much property, you could probably rip up the lawn and put a, enough laterals in, conventional laterals in rock. If nothing else, to get rid of the, the, the water by evaporation. Okay. Well, part of the problem I'm wondering is, is, is where the level of responsibility is. Yours. <laughs> well, it's I'm ultimately yours. You're the developer. Okay. This is why I keep telling people it's not amateur night, this building your own house. <laughs> if you'd hired someone to design all of these things, did you? Not everything combined, no. You see, there's no... Who do you fix three? The, the builder, I don't think, is responsible. You, you showed him what size house to build, right? Yeah. Huh. He built it. Does, does it, you built a bigger house than you were supposed to build. But we didn't know that. So. Well, that's your, but that's your stupidity. Even though, the, like the, the the developer who we bought the lot from, they 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 originally spec'd a, a certain size house which was smaller than ours for this lot. But you bought the lot. Okay. You're the developer. Okay. Now you're. I, I know you don't want to hear this, and I don't like telling you this. No, I, I, I want to hear it. But you got. But you have to bear the responsibility of. You're. You're, you're doing things that so many people. You're not alone in this. I got to tell you. Yeah. You. Well, the hell. There's four houses in the neighborhood uh, that are built on this kind of a lot. So why can't I build? Well, the other four may be in violation. They may be maybe non-conforming. There may be something else you don't know. You can't assume for what you see is what's appropriate. First thing you should have done was consulted. And I don't know how you got past the building inspectors either. That's another matter. Yeah. Didn't you have to submit plans to the community, to the planning board? Well. Or at the very least, to the, to the building inspector's office? Before we started building the house, we checked with the health department because we knew the lot was perked for a three-bedroom, two-bath house. Yeah. And we said we wanted four-bedroom, three-bath. And yeah. they said, no problem. You just put in an extra line. They never told us that this lot was designed for a house of a certain size. Well, first of all, it doesn't sound to me like the system is handling even what you described to me. Yeah. Whether it's three bedroom or two bedroom, it sounds to me like you have a defective system or a system that wasn't designed properly. And you and you may have and you may have a, 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 a action against the guy who put the septic tank in mm -hmm. because he's supposed to be the expert. Three bedroom, two bedroom, doesn't matter. It's not working right. But it would seem to me if I had the problem with, I, I know you talked about this panel system, and I don't know anything about it, which makes me, which I'm ignorant in that regard, okay? Yeah. But I'll tell you something. I, I know a little bit about septic tanks and pumping uh, effluent around and so forth. And if it were me, I'd probably be required, at this point, spend the extra money. I'd rip up the yard completely, and I would put in conventional piping. It's buried in, in ground rock and then sand around that. Well, the health department wouldn't do that, though. 
They Why not? They wouldn't give us a permit for a conventional style. Why? Because the house was bigger than what the lot was designated for. And they said... Yeah, but see, you're the guy who called the health department. That's what I'm trying to explain to you. I wouldn't have yeah. called anybody. I just got undo I was done it. We have to get a permit for them for the septic field. They come all out right, and they all say... All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. You yeah. see, I well, wouldn't have done that either. All right, just put in what you need to do. Pardon? Put in what you need Ex to put in. A lot of work is done on weekends. Yeah. When everybody's off, you know, cooking hot dogs or buying Christmas trees. But there's no inspectors floating around. An awful lot of work gets done on weekends when, you, when you're involved in a, in, a, in, a, in a bad situation like you're in now. I don't know where to tell you to go. I really don't know. Uh, I, would put, I would try to get permission. Say, look, we had a bad situation here to put a conventional system in. If it means covering the entire lot, what difference does it make once it's under the grass? You see where I'm coming from? Mm -hmm. But in my opinion, just for the future, okay, A, let an expert or a subcontractor or a contractor that's bonded with certain guarantees, he'll take the problems, and B, never call a regulatory agency to help you solve your problem. Got it. That's just, that's just sticking your hand right on fire. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Indianapolis, Indiana. Hello there. Ah, greetings, though, omnipresent one. Oh, my goodness gracious. Let's face it, you're everywhere, even the southern tip of England, as you said yourself. It, ubiquitous, I think, is the word. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. That's true. We do, we, one of our stations does reach into the U.K., and I take it you're from around the U.K. Yeah, that's right. I've been meaning to tell my friends down in southern London to give you a call, but obviously they can't reach you on the 800 number. Well, no, that, <laughs> but we'll take, we'll, take, we'll take collect calls. You would take it from England? Yes, we will. Okay. 212-245-6040. We'll take collect call from that from time to time. Would you be able to answer calls on the National Health Service? <laughs> well, that's another problem. Uh, <laughs> What's happening, guy? Okay. Well, the thing is, I came over here from England like two years ago, and I came, like a lot of my fellow countrymen, with all these starry-eyed dreams about how wonderful America was going to be and how it many is opportunities wonderful. there were going to be, you know? It is wonderful, and there are opportunities. Aha. Uh -huh. That's what I'm saying. But... Um, I came over here to work for a local radio station, uh -huh. and um, what happened like three or four weeks ago, I sent a demo tape to my uh, program director, and it was kind of an entertainment type sort of thing with uh, movie reviews and things like that. And this is to the PD of the station you're working for? Yes. What do you do there now? Uh, what I do is I'm a board op. Okay. Uh, what that is... Uh, I know what a board op is. Okay, well, I was just trying to explain to your listeners. Okay, go ahead. Um, what you do is you just uh, make sure the station goes on the air, insert the commercials, all that kind of stuff. Uh-huh. Um, and now you want to be what's laughingly, sometimes inappropriately called talent. Yeah. Now you want to become talent. Uh-huh. And they usually call us the talent, by the way. The talent? Yeah, it's just sort of like the coffee cup, the bulker, the talent. Actually, I and uh, Stu points out there are other names, but they are not appropriate for <laughs> air. Go ahead. Um, anyway, my program director called me and he said, listen, this was great. It was very well put together. Your movie reviews were very well scripted, but your problem is your accent. And I said, well, how is that? And he said, Why well, is that a problem? Well, he said that it's, if he did that, if, if, you know, if I went on the air and things like that, people might sound it's too gimmicky and they might not take to it. And you know, he has no adventure in his soul, this boy. And, well, what I, I went to the uh, news director as well, because I thought I might try and get into broadcasting in the news field. Uh -huh. And he said, yes, 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 but your problem is your accent. And I said, uh, how is that? He goes, well, you know, people here, they might get, um, you know, they might get, they might not take it too seriously. I think that's the word he used. Hey, ask him if he ever heard of Ruth Westheimer. Dr. Ruth. I yes. heard of her. Now, there's a lady with no accent at all. Hmm. Use contraceptives, no? The only, thing, the only thing that made her what she is is her accent and her, and her size, and I've known Ruth Westheimer for a decade. Right. Well, and the thing is, I also got an agent over here uh, to get me a, a voiceover spot. Mm -hmm. And um, I've, had, I've been with her for about, oh, six or seven months, and she says, well, and I've only had one job, and she says, well, also your problem is your accent because, you know, you're dealing with Hoosiers, and they like to hear Hoosiers. Well, that may well be, but there are going to be spots where they want a, want a UK or an English yeah. the one or, I had or South Africa or Australia. I mean, Crocodile Dundee didn't do too bad in Indianapolis, let me tell you. Yeah, the, the one I had was where they wanted a John Cleese type. That's the only one job I got. Mm -hmm. um, Voiceover work is very hard to get, by the way. 
<laughs> yeah, it is. Very hard to get for anybody, regardless, unless you have an established voice. It's a very tough row. Yeah. Uh, what I wanted from you, though, boss, was a second opinion. Um, I think they're crazy. Are they in the wrong state? or? Um, you know? I don't think so. I think you're in the wrong station talking to the wrong guys. <laughs> who are maybe entirely too conservative. Uh -huh. And if you're working for the station that I work for in, in Indianapolis, I'm sorry. I don't know if that's that. I think I want you to tell me now that I put down management. No, I'm not. But, uh, but the point is that uh, you got to try strange things. Uh huh. I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to think of some of the guys that have. Uh, well, uh, Howard Stern in New York doesn't exactly have the classic uh, radio voice, does he? All right, I've seen him. Nor did Howard Cosell, for that matter. Mm hmm. And a whole bunch of other people there that are extraordinary. And Paul Harvey has a very distinctive voice. Right. And I'd say they're they're not having any benefits for him. Mm -hmm. He's doing very well. I think I think your guys are not adventuresome. There was a time when everybody had to sound like everybody else. You know, we had your finger behind your ear and all that kind of, and the deep mellow tones of KKKK. Right. Now, that those days are over. Well, those someone days are over. Someone suggested the like Thank God. at least. 60 packs a day to sound like Larry King. Well, Larry isn't smoking these days either. Uh, but, um, oh, like I said, I just, um, do you know any English talent that's done well at all? <sighs> yeah, I could, well, with, with a British accent? Yes. How about Michael Jackson at KBC in Los Angeles? Mm -hmm. He's an institution in L.A. He has a number one show in L.A., I believe, competitor of ours. Uh, I've only met the man once. I, we were on Good Morning America together. Yeah. But uh, Michael Jackson is a, he's South African, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. But he clearly has a, a what we would classically call a British accent, mm -hmm. and he was the, the number one talk show in this country for a good many years till the networks. He didn't do too well in the network, I must tell you. Yeah. But his 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 failure on the network had nothing to do with his accent. His program was to Southern California, to Los Angeles for most of the country. But he certainly kicks butt in Los Angeles. I see what you mean. Well, so you've, given, you've given me some hope there, Bruce. And certainly if you keep trying in this country, I know something will come up. This is the place for it, my friend. Okay, well, thanks very much, mate. I do wish you well. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. TalkNet, 1-800-743-8000. Portland, Oregon, it's your turn. Hello there. How you doing today, Bruce? I'm doing very nicely, thank you. What's on your mind? I have a couple of questions for you. My wife and I are uh, the proverbial dinks, uh, double income, no kids. Yeah, I've heard that expression. <laughs> We've uh, doesn't last forever, usually. <laughs> Let's hope not. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm 29, she's 25, and uh, we're looking at next year, about a year from now, buying our first house. Uh, All right. In, and Why are you waiting for another year? Well, we're going to be moving in about a year. I'm, uh, I'm in the military and uh, plan on getting out in about a year. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you do? Uh, I'm a physician, flight surgeon. Mm -hmm. and okay. That, not, not in Portland. I just happen to uh, be on vacation. So. Uh, uh huh. Okay. Where are you going when you when you finish your military trip, Doc? I'm going to go do a residency. So I've got three years of residency. Where? Um, I wish I knew. Um, well, the, like, the likelihood is you should be buying any houses then. Uh, Not for three years. That, that, if you're only going to be there for three years and then move on, you should be buying any houses. That was question number one. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of the rental thing. and uh, I can appreciate that. <laughs> but the problem being, it's difficult, if not impossible, under ordinary conditions to recapture the expenses that are, that are part of acquiring a house. In under three years, unless you get lucky and, and find a place where property is appreciating like mad. And if you can find that place, will you call me, please? Okay. Because the 80s are over in that regard. All right. So that, that may help me out uh, in that regard as far as uh, is it even a good idea. Uh, uh, Ordinarily, I like, I like to see young couples buy. Right. But I think that if you're, if you're, if you're going through your transient mode, which is what you're doing right now, right? Exactly. Right. You own the, if you really can't afford to own. Okay. You, you, you said you're going to do it. You've already done a residency once, I take it. Did that in the military, if nothing else. Uh, no, I just did my internship. Uh, first year residency, and then the military puts you to work uh, because you meet the requirements for uh, uh, licensure. For a GP, huh? Exactly. So now what are you going to do your residency in? Anesthesiology. Man, you're my kind of guy. 
Uh, no, I'm de I'm very serious. I was going to use a bad word, deadly serious. <laughs> no, you're laughing, pal. But you know, I had some surgery done here a while ago, and I was I said, now who is going to put me down? And well, we'll see who's on duty. I said, no, 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 no. That's not how we choose an anesthesiologist for me. I'm going to find out who the best three people in this area are. I'm going to interview these guys. Because I consider that person as or more important than a surgeon. You're, you're dead until they wake you up. That's exactly right. And you know, uh, tragically, an acquaintance of mine three days later had a minor operation and died under the anesthesia. So I am. I respect what you guys do. Don't miss, I, I mean that. I'm not patronizing you. No reason for me to do that. But I no. You're laughing. I'm serious. So many people to say. Well, it doesn't matter who does it. They're all good. Like hell. Yeah. You're, what do they say? Fifty nine minutes of boredom and one minute of terror or something like that. That's your that's typical right. hour. The motto. Exactly. Well, I, I I just tell people be extreme. Another thing that I have people complain to me in the show about from time to time is well the uh, hospitalization only pays half of the anesthesiologist bill. I think. The hospitalization programs frequently underestimate the value of the anesthesiologist. That's a personal point of view, but having been put to sleep a great many times, I am fussy. Uh, anyway, rightly so. <laughs> Your turn. Another question: uh, uh, The military likes to uh, try to keep us around by giving us a fairly sizable bonus every year. Sure. And sure. Uh, I'm due to get that here next uh, month or so. If you want to stay. Uh, right. We have to basically we get a bonus uh, on a yearly basis. How much? Uh, it's fifteen thousand dollars. So right. take out three or four thousand for taxes. So we end up getting nine or ten thousand dollars. Right. Um, I have two car loans that are still outstanding. One is. Uh, well, you're taking the bonus this year. Yes. Okay. I mean, go ahead. I got another year of active duty left. Go ahead. Um, one, uh, I violated uh, Bruce's rule number 800. And, uh, <laughs> what you the, did? The, the what did you did? Did the five-year car loan. Okay, uh, yep. That's uh, one of my rules. I've been uh, I've been putting $1,000 a month uh, off on that, and I'm, I've got it down to about $2,000. I'm going to pay it off uh, when this next uh, chunk of money comes in. Okay. My question is the, uh, the other auto, which is uh, only about a year and a half old. It's uh, financed at 9.9%, and I have to have a... Uh, approximately nine thousand dollars left. I'm wondering. But, but the problem is, is it simple, or is it uh, the rule of seventy eight to the rule of nines, where you've already paid all the interest? Now you only have principal outstanding. I, it's uh, it's simple. I can uh, pay it off at any time without uh, without penalizing myself as far as having okay. Paid. Let me take a little time out here, and we'll continue this for a second, Doc. Okay. Sure. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talk Matt. Now I'm chatting with a, a young physician who is getting out of the military, and to brought down to its essence. Uh, the, the the used to be there was a value in some consumer debt. There's no value today. For you to pay that nine percent, in my opinion, is foolish. If you can get rid of that debt and you have a little bit of a cushion and you do have the social uh, insulation from the world as being a part of the military, I would dump the debt if it were me. Dump the debt, get rid of it. You got it. Good luck, Doc. Thank you very much. I'm Bruce Williams. Oh, no, no, no more. No more. I got to go to New York City. I was going to give it out to you. That's not the thing to do. Hello, New York. We got about two minutes to spend together. Hi, Bruce. Uh, I appreciate you taking my call. Love your show. Thank uh, you. My car was stolen, and after the car was recovered, one of the items stolen out of it was the radio. Right. Now, the radio had... Naturally. Yes. You're in New York. What yes. else? <laughs> now, the radio had been replaced three weeks before under the warranty by the dealership. Okay. And the radio, I have a letter from the dealer... The radio is, uh, has a list price of $967. Right. Originally, the insurance company offered me $200. After I called... Was this, the, no, hold on, was this original equipment? Original equipment. Okay. After a few choice uh, exchanges of words, they upped it to, they would... Madison, Wisconsin, hello there. Well, good evening, Bruce. Good evening, my friend. From Frigid, Wisconsin. Yeah, pretty drafty. Yeah, it is. Actually, we're having a heat wave. It's about 20 degrees now. Is it really? Yeah. That's pretty, still pretty cool. I'll tell you, I'm in, in Florida right now, and it's uh, you could see your breath last night, which <laughs> shocker for Florida. Of course, it was in the middle 70s all day today. Yeah, but that can be pretty shocking if you're not used to it. Well, I travel a lot. Yeah. Well, it's it's shocking when you walk outside here and your nostrils stick together, you know. That's, that, that's how cold uh, it is. Totally uncivilized. <laughs> What's on your mind? Well... I'm a, I'm a paranoid 26-year-old. I'm uh, I, the, the question is, is it worth going into $20,000 worth of debt for an MBA? It depends. Well, uh, my 
my plan is and what, I, what I'm interested in is brand management or uh, working in an advertising agency as an account executive. Uh, well, I don't know there's any future in brand managing. Let's, let's explain to people what a brand manager is. A uh, major manufacturer like Procter or the House of Lever, one of those companies, has a ton of brands. Uh, let's assume that they have three different toothbrush, toothbrushes, toothpastes that they produce, which is not an unusual number, right? Right. Each brand will have what's called a brand manager who is in competition with his buddies in the company selling their brands. And he does whatever he has to do or is allowed to do or is capable of doing within whatever parameters are established in promoting his brand. Is that about the size of it? That's about the size of it. But is there any dough in that? It's, it may be a step to... Uh, some other level of management, but I don't think anybody ever made the important money being a brand manager, do they? Suppose I guess I guess not. Then uh, uh, just just the idea of marketing a product. Well, it gets you, and it, yeah, okay. But I'm, oh, but I think that's a, a beginning, not an end. Okay, okay, then. Or then. maybe maybe it's in the middle. Not I don't think you. I don't know if you begin as a brand. You might be an assistant manager or some that kind. Okay, but marketing is is what I really want to do. Well, what's marketing? What does that mean? That is, it's like the elephant, you know, with the seven blind men. <laughs> right. Really, has it, it means different things to different people. Well, marketing to me basically means figuring out how to put a, a company's product in the hands of its customers. All right. And uh, you know, through how many different ways you can do that. And um, uh, I was looking uh, at, at some one ads. And you know some job job ads in Chicago and Minneapolis and so on and so forth. And Think of all those cold places. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, right. we can't can't move too far away. Why? But, well, hold on. Why is that? Well, actually, to be honest with you, I'm willing to move anywhere. And, well, I'm glad to hear that because that be a severe restriction on yourself. As, and as is my wife. So mm -hmm. okay. Um, but all of these these jobs in in the ads say you have to have an MBA. Well, if that's the, if that's the case, then. What we're talking about, what is your first name? Dave. We're talking, Dave, about a union ticket. Right. Isn't that true? Yeah. I don't know if anybody ever taught, did any of the ads say you had to learn something as an MBA? No. No, it just said you had to have the credential. Right. And why is that? Because they can get it. Uh, that's, that's, what that's what it comes down to. There, there are, are jobs today. I remember one job, I, I don't want to be too specific for obvious reasons, because it was a family member. But I mean, I was very proud of her because she took a job with a degree that only called for a high school graduate. But every holder of that job in the, la in, in, in the memory of anybody with a company was always a college graduate. Why? Because it got him into the door. Right. It got him into this major corporate giant. You, you, you get an interview. But, well, not only that, no, but beyond the interview, yet you were, you were in their mail room or whatever it happened to be, but you were, were working for the company now. Right. And even though you were pushing a mail card, and I'm using that as an example, where it only required a, a relatively modest amount of education, getting in there was the big thing. And that's why she took the job and moved right along in management eventually. Now, if you're telling me that the positions that you covet all require an MBA, go get one. And the next question is, and I don't know the answer to this, and this is going to require you've done some research of a sort, uh, does it matter whence the MBA comes? Now, it's clearly, if you're going to work for some of the big financial houses, Wharton is the place to go, isn't it? Right. But a Wharton degree for what you're talking about might be a total waste. And the expense of, of, of getting a Wharton degree, which is not exactly chop liver. Right. And and what I what my opinion is is if I get an MBA from a from a major uh, in, a reputable institution. Yeah, you got a great college right there in Madison. Exactly, exactly. Which is where I have my undergraduate degree. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but you see, I do a little bit of research first. I think that's probably a valid assumption. But before I invested a couple of years of my life and however many bucks it takes, right. I do some research to be certain what you and I think is reasonable and logical is in fact accurate. That they that there is it is not incumbent upon you to go back with a. A, an Ivy League or its counterpart MBA in order to attain the goals you're looking for. I don't think that you will. But before I invested the time and money and effort, I'd sure find out. Good luck, Dave. I'm Bruce Wiggins. This is TalkNet. WDBO Country, Orlando, Florida. Hello there.
Hello, Bruce. Hello, baby. How are you? I'm just fine, thank you. My first time talking to you. Well, I'm very happy that you called. What's up? Well, my husband and I sold a house that we owned four years ago, uh, and we went owner financing. Uh -huh. And it was uh, a seven-year balloon mortgage. The woman mm -hmm. put down $30,000. It was 10%. $300,000 house. No, no. She put down... Um, $30,000 down payment. Well, you said 10%. Well, we, uh, we're we doing a, a, a... No, wait a minute. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. You said 30,000, 10%. Now, do you mean 30,000, 10% interest, or 30,000 is 10% of the mortgage? 10% uh, interest, oh, okay. and she put down 30,000. On how much of a principal? Uh, how much is the whole house worth? How much she owe you originally? The house was 102000 Okay, then she owes you 72000 in Right. All right. Okay. Well, these past two years, we've had a lot of problems with her, with bounce checks, not full payments. Or close. Well, you know, we wanted to do that, but we've heard things. What uh, things? Well, that when you try to foreclose, that she can go into bankruptcy. So what? And tie the house up. That's not true. You stand in front of the bankruptcy. How can you can do that? How do you no, do that? No, it's not a question that you can do it. You do do it. You stand in front of the bankruptcy. Hello? Yes. I, I don't... Uh, well, in, in other words, do you think for a moment any bank in the whole world would loan money on a home if they could not stand in front of the IRS or stand in front of the, of the bankruptcy courts? They wouldn't be allowed to. The banks would go broke. Mm-hmm. Okay, who, I guess, who, you, who you been talking to, your bartender or your lawyer? I've been talking to people who... No, have you talked to your lawyer, period? Uh, yes, we talked to him once. Um, what did he say? He had said to us when we had mentioned uh, foreclosure, not uh, this time, one other time, uh, he said, you don't want to do that. It looks tempting, but you don't want to do but that. He didn't, but he didn't tell you anything about this other stuff that you just told me, about bankruptcy. and so He never mentioned that, did he? No, but Sorry, that's I right, called him today for an appointment for next week, okay. and I said, you know, we just are fed up with her, and we just, you know, uh, it's getting harder and harder to try to get money out of her. Right, let's let's start with this. How much is how in much in default is she? She's only one month, but it's she didn't pay us this month, but it's all. Uh, hold it, hold it. She didn't pay this for January. Right. Well, you can't. Do it. You, you, nothing you can do about that. Not yet. It's too early. It's too early. Okay. You know, well, hold it. Listen, she, she's up to date through December of 1994. No, she owes some money from December. Well, how much? Not much. How it's much? Thirty something dollars. Well, then you apply that. How much did she pay you in January? Um, nothing. If her check bounced. All right. Then she's one. She's January plus a portion of December. How come thirty odd dollars? How'd that happen? Uh, she gave us, um, came over and gave us a money order mm. that, you know, covered some of what she owed. Mm. Uh, well, then she is, up, she is in default for December. If you don't pay it all, you're in default. Right. Uh, but that's not, it's, not, it's too early to foreclose, I'll tell you that right now. How right. long does that take? Then? Well, it's not how a question months? of how long. It's how, it, technically, you can, def, you can start foreclosure the day she's in default. But she could cure that very easily. The courts would allow her to cure it. They would. Yes, ma'am. Now, okay. And a couple of months. I mean, I think maybe uh, you're getting uh, a little bit hyper. It happens in business. Well, it's not just that. It's the fact that she's supposed to pay her house insurance, and she uh, continually lets it lapse. She goes right. down just the day it's due, and this goes on month wait a minute, after wait month. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, you see, you just said two things. Which is accurate? You said she lets it lapse, and then you said she goes down to the last day. Those are entirely separate and contradictory statements. Which is it? They've been giving her extensions. But, yeah. but, but she didn't let it lapse then. Okay. Well, there's a big deal. You walk into court, they're going to cut your throat. Okay. Because you made an untrue statement. Well, you we said, just get letters all the time from the insurance company. I understand all that. that. It's going to lapse or whatever. It's or they're going to cancel. But, it's, but it hasn't lapsed. Now, you're right. You shouldn't get those notices. But don't say it's lapsed. Say what you just told me. Okay. That, that, that you received cancellation notices and so forth. That's an accurate statement. Okay. But the best that has it ever lapsed where well, there's no coverage? Yes, it was a couple of weeks. Okay. Well, that's serious stuff, you say. That's serious stuff. If you're a professional lender, that couldn't happen because you have automatic insurance that kicks in, but you don't. Right. And what you should do in the instance if it does happen, and the company has to notify you mm -hmm. as a lien holder. 
then you ought to call your insurance agent and instantly have a policy issue, which she will pay for, has to pay for. Well, you know, I did check with the insurance company, and they told me that the only one that can have insurance on the house is the deed holder. That's not true. Well, and that the only way that we could do it was with forced place insurance. It would cost us 10 times the amount that's, of her insurance. Ah, that's, that, that, now, wait a minute. That's a different matter. And she has to pay it. Okay. She, if you, if you, in other words, you have a right to protect your interest. Similarly, if you finance automobiles and the person who owns the car drops the collision and doesn't pay the collision coverage, then that that card is the security for a loan. You have every right as a lien holder to put insurance in place, which may cost, as you said, 10 times as much. And the person who owns the car has got to pay for it before they get a clean title. And the same thing is true with her. I see. Can I just ask you one more question? Sure. I'm not picking on you, but you got to be, you could shoot yourself right in the foot by saying the wrong thing. Right. Well, I would have a lawyer speak for me. Okay. But, uh, well, yeah, but the problem with that scenario is you might be called to testify. I see. Yeah, be careful what you say, that's all. Right. Well, I just hear horror stories about people who uh, who don't pay their mortgage. And what then... horror stories have you heard, Tony? Okay, I've heard that there was someone on our block that uh, went owner financing, and um, the person that uh, bought the house from them couldn't pay them for whatever reason, and when they tried to do a foreclosure, the person claim went into bankruptcy they went to court or i don't know how they did it exactly and they um they're still sitting in this house well, they may have gone into chapter 13 which is wage earners bankruptcy where you sometimes can keep your creditors at bay just as chapter 11 does that for a business but most of these stories you hear are stories and you only hear part of the story not the entire story mm -hmm. now the thing is that I don't know why you went owner financing. Could you explain that to me? Thirty percent down. Um, we had we weren't able to sell the house, and we were just getting, I guess. Yeah, but um, why, with thirty percent down, why was she not able to get a, a mortgage of her own? She came from out of state. She came here with no job, right. and um, you know, we we just were selling the house. We t we went to a realtor, and we tried to sell it for quite a few months and we couldn't so mm -hmm. the realtor brought the, forth you know uh, the, yeah the real estate guy wants a commission right and it's not it meant whether it was your best interest is another story right so, uh, so of did, course did, we're sorry we did this now well, there's nothing wrong with owner financing let's start with that it may or may not have been done the way it should have been done i don't know the answer to that you certainly were given a decent interest rate 10 points not a bad rate of interest mm -hmm. uh whether it, but if she was real stinko you see, when, 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 when the banks won't touch somebody, banks are not in the business of saying no. They never made a nickel saying no. Can we agree on that? Right. Well, if they say no, you can ask yourself, why am I smart saying yes? Mm -hmm. Now, there may be a time when there is a smart answer to say yes, even though the banks say no. That is not uh, commonplace. More often than not, it's not a good decision for you if the banks say no. Well, I don't know if she went to the bank. I think that because she did not have a job, I don't well, know. There's no point in going to the bank without a job. Right. And I heard that, you know, a lot of people do that. They come down here with no job and then they they can't, if they don't have a job. Then... Well, no kidding. But if the bank won't lend money to somebody without a job, why do you suppose that is? Because they're a poor risk. <laughs> then why would you want to take a poor risk? Because we were stupid. <laughs> not stupid, no. You, but you were tempted. With 30% down, you're not at any great jeopardy. Let's start with that. You really aren't. Okay. But but uh, it, it, but the fact that she's only a couple of months out of, out of she's not going to, you're not going to foreclose on her for being two months down. Okay. Three, four months, maybe, yes. And then what you do then is you, then you accept no more partial payments. Your lawyer will sure will tell you that. Okay. Period. It's going to be tempting. She walks in. How much is your monthly payment? Six sixty two. She walks in with five hundred in cash. Tempted to say, it's hard to say no, isn't it? Right. But if you want to foreclose, you got to say no, no, ma'am. You got to give me all or nothing. Can uh, you refuse to take checks? Absolutely. If it's not complete. Oh, do you mean because they they've been bouncing? Right. I don't know the answer to that. Whether okay. that. Okay. Uh, I know people do it. Whether you can or not, that's one for your attorney. But you certainly can refuse partials. Okay. So, in other words, my, my husband was thinking about, you know, selling the mortgage to a mortgage company. You can do that, but you'll take a hell of a hit. Like five, six, seven thousand. How much? 
More? Oh, a lot more. Really? In your case, $70,000 mortgage. I'm going to say at least 25, 23, something like that for you. Oh, my. So it's a, to our best interest to hold on to this and go through all the aggravation that she puts us in, through? In my opinion, yes. And uh, then if she can't come up with the money in three years... Then you can foreclose then, too, on the balloon. Because then she'll have no excuse. Well, she'll she probably stole you for a year. She could steal us for another... Probably so. Mean, she, could she live in that house for probably months so. and months without paying? Probably so. Aha. Uh -huh. And could destroy it as well. Probably so. Aha. Uh -huh. Those are the facts of life, unfortunately. I'm not saying she would or will. Yeah. But you said could. Mm -hmm. I do wish you well, baby. Thank you so much. I'm Bruce Williams. Hang in. Look, these are the pro these are the hazards of business, and this is what we're talking about, business. This is TalkNet. Looks to me like we're going to St. Simon Island, Georgia. Hello there. Hey, thanks for taking the call. You're very welcome. Hey, landlord trying to keep some money from me from a rent deposit. Mm -hmm. Had an $850 deposit, lived in the house for three years, got an itemized bill of damages. Well, let's take, take a deep breath. Did we do a walkthrough on your left? Huh? Did you sure do did. a walkthrough? You sure did or did, did not? Did not. Did not. Okay. Bruce, Georgia has beautiful landlord tenants law with walkthroughs on uh, occupancy and departure. And you didn't do that? But it doesn't apply if the person has 10 units or less. Is that right? Yeah. There's an exemption in there. Interesting idea. Go ahead. Now, this person meets that exemption, I take it. Yes, he does. Okay. So, um, forty dollars in materials damage. What, rent, what, what, hold on, what kind of material? What does that mean? Uh, like a drywall or something? Replacement items, yeah. All right, forty bucks. Yeah. What's the rest? Out of his pocket, seven hundred ten. He kept for himself for labor. Uh, things well, like. Well, well what, let's let's break it down a little bit. I mean, okay. labor is a legitimate item. Sure. But whether or not he has seven hundred and ten dollars worth is another program. Let's talk about it. Well, it totals up to seven hundred and ten. Well, without regard to that, yeah. if I <laughs> hey, I'm gonna charge you seven hundred bucks for calling me just now. Totals yeah. right up. I got it right on my pad here. Uh, six a dollar for the call and six ninety nine for being so nice to you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's let's uh, talk about it. Okay, light bulb burned out. One dollar for the light bulb, seven fifty installation. You gotta be kidding. No. Uh, lime stains in toilet bowl, fifteen dollars for removal. There was a bathroom mirror with water damage. A fifteen-year-old mirror, you know, steam, the flaking on that type of thing. Go ahead. What else? Thirty-five dollars installation for it, and I went to a local vendor where the receipt was from, and that was for a decorator mirror. Uh, Go, ahead. Go ahead. Leaf removal, forty bucks. Leaf? Where? And where are the leaves? Uh, on, at the back of the lot. Was it your job to keep the lot clean or whatever? Uh, yes. But what happened was the leaf removal occurred four or two, eight weeks after we moved out. Talked to the boy that he claimed to be a lawn care service is a kid with a rake. <laughs> Go ahead. Eight weeks after we're out. Just a whole pattern like that. And, um, well, I would, I would see him in small claims court if well, that, I were you. That's where I'm uh, sitting pretty good because I'm here and he's there. And you talk about people, you know, being run back and forth, distant, mm -hmm. distant landlords. Mm -hmm. Well, he's the distant landlord, and I'm the local tenant, and I'm still here, so I can run him back and forth. Mm -hmm. But my question is, how far can I go in discovery in small claims court? Well, I don't know the answer. You can't go discovery in the, you mean before the fact, you mean? Sure. I mean, but, you know, production of documents. Can I ask for his records for other rental properties? I doubt it very seriously. Past tenants, tax returns? I doubt it. I mean, you're, you're trying to harass him with discovery is what you're saying. To sure. Me. I don't think they'll, like, the court was going to say. The court's going to ask, what do you need all that for? What, okay. what, would your answer, what would your answer be? Show a pattern. Mm. Show a pattern of abuse. That's a good answer, but would the tax return necessarily reflect that? I don't know. If if he's, you know, displaying deceit, like charging seven fifty for installation, charging me portal to portal uh, time for him to drive up and make these damages if i can show a pattern of abuse well i see what you're saying but i don't think they're going to i don't think and also go too far that. and go to his veracity and uh, scraping the list or lack of it <laughs> maybe ask you know is he paying social security tax on his income that type of thing <laughs> well you're tough i think you probably could ask those questions in court if he shows up okay 
And then, um, okay, supposing I get a judgment, what can that's, I do? That's another matter. Another matter, huh? He, now you see the fact that he's in a different place is going to work for him. Mm-hmm. But you, you certainly could get a judgment or a, a lien against the house, file a lien against the property. Sure. Now, sooner or later, he's going to want to sell that. Mm-hmm. And, of course, you know, Georgia allows for treble damages in these matters. Well, I didn't know that. Yeah, but, well, of course, the same exemption for 10 units or less applies. I'm sorry? The same exemption for 10 units or less applies. <laughs> <laughs> Tenants, uh, you know, are at a loss. Landlords are at the benefit. Well, more often than not, in most states and jurisdictions, the uh, tenant, the, the the weight of the law and the, everything is slanted toward the tenant. Mm -hmm. It's not much here. easier for the tenant. Well, I'm not sure if that's true either. You tell me part of it here. Well, yeah, it's, it's very but fair. If, if you, if the other side, uh, if if you didn't pay him for three months, how long would it take him to kick you out? Oh yeah, it's, yeah. Cuts both ways. You're yeah. starting to say it's very fair, or whatever. Sure. You said something about. It. I interrupted you. You said it started to say it's. Oh fair. yeah, it's very fair if you're in a you know larger complex uh -huh. where you get the walkthroughs on both ends guaranteed by law mm -hmm. and that type of thing. But on the situation where a person only has one or two units, the law is definitely in favor of the landlord. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're looking for equity in law... That's all I want my money back. <laughs> <laughs> I like your style. I, I go to court and ask him all these questions. Uh, Mr. So-and-so, uh, th this is 1995. This took place in 1994. Uh, did you, uh, because this was labor... Uh, pay the appropriate Social Security and Medicare taxes? And if so, can you document it? Hmm. Would it also be fair to say he would have to have a county business license? I doubt it. Well, you could ask the question. Sure. You have a good time. Oh, yeah, I think I think it's going to be more fun than anything. It's really the principal. Never go for, well, I would say never go for principal. Go for the money. <laughs> I wish you well, Dan. Thank you, Bruce. Hey, you're, something good come out of the baseball strike. Listen, what baseball strike? I thought they're just going to discontinue baseball. Ah, uh, no. I'll be the greatest thing ever happened to this country. <laughs> I, I wish you well, guy. Okay. Bye. We'll watch all the old. We'll watch all the old Ty Cobb and Babe Ruth movies then. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talknet. To the Lone Star State, Houston, Texas. Hello there. Good evening, Bruce. Good evening. I remember uh, pr just prior to New Year's, you were talking quite a bit about uh, flying out over the Gulf and how much you enjoyed it. Yeah, I saw a guy cracked up yesterday. Ooh, that's never a pleasant sight. No, he lost an engine at 1,000 feet. Ooh. And uh, they all three guys made it. The airplane didn't do so well. He was flying a single, I take it. He was flying a Mooney, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was curious. Are you? I, I had heard that you were possibly interested in looking at buying airplanes as we speak. Is that correct? I'm still looking for a good 182, yes. I'm amazed that you don't look for a 310 or a Baron, Bruce. Nah, it's too much airplane right now. Yeah, but as deep as your pockets are, the cost difference isn't that much. That's the cost difference is what I'm talking about at all. Okay. It's more airplane than I want to fly. Then you feel like you could maintain proficiency. That's correct. And, and that's the only downside in a twin is if you don't right. maintain proficiency, you're more dangerous there than in a single. Absolutely. I mean, it's not a question of what I... I I mean, I'm not a wealthy guy, but I'm yeah, I make a couple of bucks. I figured your pockets were deep enough to afford it. If I you could wanted it. I could afford it if I, if I felt that I could fly it safely. Right. And and I may feel that way a year from now. You know, I was away from flying for a dozen years, mm -hmm. and I've been back getting a, a fair amount of time in. I'm flying two or three times a week, which is I think the only way to fly. If you're going to do it, and I may move up, say, to a 206 or a 210 relatively soon. Mm -hmm. But right now, I feel more comfortable in a in a skyline or, or or its counterpart, somewhere in that that ballpark. Right. And then, uh, hey, it's it's a workhorse, and it'll get me where I want to go, not at any great speeds. I have a very good friend, and he has an Aztec, mm -hmm. which is a nice airplane. And he, this guy, was a former command bomber pilot. But in my opinion, he doesn't fly often enough anymore. Very quickly, and, did y'all change stations in Houston? I don't know the answer to that. Maybe Danny could tell you. It happens from, you know, we, we, we're in a, in a business that's always in a state sure. of flux. Hey, keep your wheels up, Guy, and I appreciate your comment and your question. It's been a good hour, kids. You've made it so, and that's appreciated. Hey, and we'll do it again real soon. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talk Nest. Without regard to that. Okay. If, yeah. if, if, you, if, you're, if I'm You're spending right. 60 bucks or 50 bucks an hour for a vacation... I don't want to blow it trying to save 20 cents. Maybe I, I maybe I got something wrong with me. I don't no, know. No, I would say you probably know a little bit more about that than me. 
so I'll, I'll give you the credit for that. What is this observation of? There's no yeah. knowledge there. It's just observation. Well, um, we do get a lot of influx of um, people from the city. Mm-hmm. Um, would we? Do you think there is a market for that? to come into the area and fly. I know we've done it with people, but we've never organized a package. We thought we'd put it during the October season when the leaves change. Hmm. Well, I, I, want, I don't have any question that there's a market. Whether people are willing to stay, and I don't know the answer to this, uh-huh. uh, and a little market research would probably turn up something. I don't know what the average stay is when someone vacations in the Pennsylvania Dutch country. I have a young man that works with me, mm-hmm. and he and his family has two children, spend a couple of days there every year but you notice it's did a couple of days right not a week right and i don't know that there's enough in your part of the world to interest anybody for a week yeah well then maybe that would be more of a maybe there is i don't know i'm, I'm i just don't i don't know the area well i've been around york and that area mm-hmm. uh, Lan, uh lancaster and so forth i don't know that there's enough there to, to hold somebody's attention for a week mm-hmm. perhaps there is I mean, correct me i don't know but i just don't know of anything that would keep mine certainly for more than a couple of days right I think you may be right. I think maybe it would be more of a two-day event. Hmm. That's a different story. You see, and of course, you're, as you know better than I, you are at the whim of the wind right. and the weather. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's it, you can't say, well, I'll take you from A to B because you don't know which way the prevailing is going right. to go. You, you may have a, 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 three days out of four, they may come from the west to the southwest or something. But mm-hmm. just as sure as hell, if you promise somebody they're going to go in one direction, the wind will screw you up and take you exactly. somewhere else. Exactly. So you never promise. That's why... Right. Well, I can't tell you the name of the company, but that's why the name of our company is well, probably, on the script. <laughs> What's the name of the company? Give it it's a plug. Adventures Aloft. Okay. So it's an adventure because we never know where we're going. Sure. You have a chase car down below with a little radio saying, hey, I got you. Right, yeah. right. I, yeah. I've been there. Yeah, yeah I, that's I, the fun of it. I think you, I, I would recommend a hot, hot air balloon ride to anybody. It's a great birthday present. Uh, it's something that's different. It's not going to be, uh, everybody's not going to have it on their plate. Mm-hmm. And there's some people that, that are not going to do it. it but I, I can tell you from, I don't know how many times I've been in a hot air balloon, but certainly a good many times. Putting aside that adventure in New York, which was stupid, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a very non-threatening thing. Uh, it's very quiet, except that, that huge roar you get when you turn the gas on for right. a few seconds. I don't, very frankly, because uh, I've said this publicly, and I'm going to have to say it again, I don't recommend those big air balloon, hot air balloon meets. I think they're dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> because, well, they are. Because yeah, you, you, you come up under somebody else, could top right of your balloon. Mm-hmm. And if the guy up above isn't watching for the traffic below, that could be a... We were bumping into people when I was in this thing. Mm-hmm. And I think those can be a little bit... Uh, I, I'm not sure if that's amateur night. Yeah, we... Uh, our people ask us all the time if we go to Albuquerque. And we say, mm-hmm. we'd love to go and visit, um, but we're not going to take our balloon. Mm-hmm. Well, as I say, I was in the balloon on that for about four hours. Oh, in the wow. middle of that whole thing. It's gorgeous to see. Mm-hmm. But I was a little uncomfortable, and I've been a pilot for a long time. Yeah. When you start getting so close, you're bumping into other people, mm-hmm. which is exactly what was happening. Uh, I think that's a little... And, and, and I asked the guy, how come you don't have a view plate in the bottom of the basket? I meant that sincerely. Mm-hmm. So you can watch somebody if, if somebody's coming up underneath you. Yeah. Instead of having to lean over and look. Yeah. Uh, and he said, well, he gave me a lot of reasons why not. None of them that I could think were very good reasons. Because, <laughs> because you can't see above you. Uh-huh. And if there's somebody up there and you ran him, you've got a serious problem. Yeah, it's the one above has the right of way. But how do you know that? When you're down below and there's a guy up above you, you can't I'm, I'm see sorry, him. I'm sorry, I said that backwards. The yeah, the one, guy, I said that backwards. The other the way. The guy around. below has yeah, the right of way. Yeah, the guy that's below because you can't see who's up around you, obviously. Exactly, so it's your responsibility if you're hired to get out of the way. Right, and if you don't want to go higher... Or you can't. Yeah, you're in you're in trouble. No, no, you're not in trouble. <laughs> the guy below you is in trouble. I think that you probably could promote, uh, and you might be able to promote, i got to let you go, you might be able to promote it in conjunction with some other activities. You know, work out a, work out a partnership with some other people with these bed and breakfasts that, that are already bringing people in, offer it as another adventure for them, for the people they are advertising for. You also... Uh, might want to offer this to companies who are looking for some kind of either incentive bonus or a gift for their employees, which is relatively modest and something a little bit different. There are a lot of ways. And it is a lot of fun. I'll endorse that. I'm Bruce Williams. Hang in. This is TalkNet.